it seems to be we're set for the Fed to pause in June, and I would expect that to be the case. Our view is for economic deterioration. It's kind of a slow burn. A certain amount of pricing power has accrued to corporates, and that's the part of inflation that will be, you know, relatively sticky. We still generally like non-U.S. markets for the U.S. because we still think the U.S. is on the more expensive side. We have the first cut penciled in for March of 2024, so we still have quite a ways to go before we get that first cut. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. We need special mood music for when they come out and say talks were good. You know, like better sounds. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Do you get Basically, that? Yeah, like, like and then like, violins yeah, when yeah, it gets yeah. really bad and it's yeah. sad and it's dodgy. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, I think the nation's sort of oh, worn out. Yeah. Yeah. I think the nation is like almost moved beyond. You like, think? Okay, let's get to June and you know get it fixed and move on. Talks were productive. You ready to move on? No, it's next week Tuesday. That's what I'm calling it right now, folks. That's what I'm beginning to see. I saw it last night about 8 p.m. I'm starting to see the language next week. All of a sudden, too, John, you mentioned this yesterday. Yeah, Janet Yellen's bringing it this way, but we're going that way. The calendar's moving, and I'm sorry, it's next week. Tuesday. Before the happy talk in Washington, D.C., Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is doubling down on this early June warning. We'll catch up with Greg Vallier a little bit later this hour. I have to say, it's pretty scathing about this, Bramo. If the X date really is June 1, we're in trouble here. Which is the reason why the mood talks aren't really helping when you take a look at some of the pricing, particularly on the short end of the yield curve. Some people might say, well, there are a whole host of other reasons. Maybe so. But still, it is clear that it is political uh, dynamite for either side to allow the U.S. to default. At the same time, they're not getting closer to a resolution, but the deadline is drawing no. closer, so the chances for a technical <clears throat> default are rising. We're going to start strong this hour with an expert on those dynamics of three month and two year and, and all that. But I, I think that the debate is sort of removed from what we see in the markets. This is now a political debate. And I'm sorry, I'm going to go to the immediacy of it. Something changed yesterday. You saw it in the meeting. And it's today, this Tuesday, it's next week, Tuesday. That's all there is to it. Yields climbing for eight consecutive sessions. Eight now. Yields up again this morning at the front end, close to 440. Yeah. Last time we had a day when the two-year yield was lower it was all the way back in May 11th, I believe. And we were at about 390. Bramo. So we've had a big adjustment at the front end of the curve, encouraged by a Federal Reserve who just refuses to call this a pause. They just don't want to say it. Just don't call it a pause seems to be the approach from Fed officials. And Jim Buller took it one step further, where he said not only do we not want to call it a pause, but we're going to raise rates two more times probably by the end of this year. There's a tension right now between a banking crisis that isn't and uh, an economy that is, an economy that's really grinding forward. And at what point <clears throat> do people have to reset back to uh, sort of a pre-March kind of reality and do that in the is, yield space is, as well? Is Bank of America resetting on a bull market call? 4,300? Yeah, that got a lot of play yesterday. And they think there's some guys. upside so, here, sure. So Rita was, was, was out there. I mean, it got a lot of play. I think we're catching up with Savita a little bit later I, I, I this morning. I hope so. Very Savita cool. Savita where was she, John? 35? She was 3, at 4,000 for this year. Okay, but this is a big deal. This is you know, up. This, up, up, up. And they're doing it with rates going Crushing up. It. It's It's bizarre. Live from New York City this morning. <laughs> good morning, good we morning. We haven't talked about the elephant in the room. What's that? She's, you know, Bramo. I, I mean, you know, Tom's in his office falling apart because Mr. Roy died, and Bramo's making a cameo Are on you, Secession. Okay, stop there. Yeah, I told you yesterday. No spoilers. I'm not. All right. Okay. I'm not. You done derailing the program? No, she was just. Uh, she's like the star. Everybody was all over Twitter yesterday. Bramo is the star of this Bramo show. Bramo was the star. She's of the star of Succession. That's you know, not a surprise to me. Yeah, you know. Okay. okay. Not the star of Succession. There was a tiny little picture in the far distance of B-roll that I was happy. Well, to it be meant in. a lot to me, Bramo. So it don't meant spoil a lot it. To me too. All right. Equity softer on the S&P 500, <laughs> negative by about 0.2 percent. Take a look at the euro. The data out this morning. Manufacturing data in the eurozone terrible services just really, about okay yeah, but the euro is breaking down 107 77 yeah. just another retreat this morning lisa a weaker euro and it's interesting that you point to the manufacturing side huge disappointment but on the other side the services sector came out better than expected with increased pricing pressure this is two sides of the wrong coin for a region that still faces a lot of inflation but also potentially some sort of decline in what we're seeing we're going to get that view in u.s economic data in just one second but today we do hear a host of different speakers from the cutter economic forum ken mullis will be on the show from mullis and company bill winters will be joining 
joining us, Group CEO of Standard Chartered and the CEO of Boeing, to be uh, sort of interesting to see uh, following on the Ryanair discussion we had yesterday. Then when it comes to the PMIs in the U.S., we get that around 945, around 10 a.m., we get, in other words, a sense of do we see the same kind of bifurcation in the U.S. at a time when economic data has been surprising to the upside at the fastest pace going back are, about a year. Are these PMIs the same as the early month PMIs? Aren't there like four flavors of PMIs? You get S&P Global and you get ISM. Okay. Yeah. Which one do you look at? I think ISM in America has a, a longer history and a lot of people pay a little bit more attention to that. These are S&P? These are S&P, yeah. Okay, great. Got that. But everything counts. Okay. Everything's important. You really are trying to derail this program. No, this morning, just aren't you? PMIs. What's a PMI? I don't Ramo, know. PMI anything else? Is. Yeah, just uh, Dallas Fed President Lori Logan at 9 a.m. Perhaps she'll give it more of a sense. And happy birthday also to uh, Henry Kissinger, who's speaking at the Economic Club of New York in, on his uh, 100th birthday. He's 100. It's his wow. 100th birthday today. Wow, still going. He's happy birthday. He's focused <laughs> on immigration and migrants, he's focused on the diaspora of, of America. I mean, still going, still talking at these events, Bramo, not retiring. I know, still active. I know, that's impressive. Oh, Lisa, right. George Concarvis joins us now, <laughs> head of US macro strategy at MUFG. George, Speaker McCarthy says the tone was better. It was better. Does that bring you any comfort? Look, yeah, actually, what's been really impressive about this whole debt ceiling discussion, considering that it took so long to get to where we are, I mean, there were two months gap, nothing you know, being discussed, and all of a sudden now there's optimism. The, t the tack is much different. I mean, in the prior debt ceiling, you know, sort of sh showdowns, you had like a much more acrimony going towards the last minute. This one feels like they're, they're trying to create kumbaya towards uh, an actual resolution. I hope that that's, that spirit is, the, is in the right place and that they actually get something that's done soon because the time right. is uh, ticking, as Tom pointed out. But I do think it obviously does uh, help that they're being much more optimistic. But we got to see some some actual uh, details uh, before the markets really believe it. George, if this gets fixed, as many presume, what does the three month T bill yield do? So, like the the whole T bill curve has a bunch of uh, uh, you know, up and down type movements, which are really kind of sending mixed signals. But a lot of it in the very front end related to this debt ceiling debacle. Uh, at a minimum, we should get some normalization closer to like Fed funds, and I think that that would create a much more smoother yield curve. I look at the smoother yield curve we'll get, but then does it reset low? Are you modeling in a disinflation as so many others are? Yeah, no, our, our view is like we really have two paths here. And, and one of it was a glimpse that we the first sort of uh, shock wave that we got in March, as well as uh, you know, this, this kind of lingering bank crisis and turmoil that we're in. If that path, if it continues to kind of you know exert credit tightness and a credit crunch really develops in the U.S. economy, then the Fed has to probably cut much more than what's priced in. Uh, on the other side, if it's purely just you know this immaculate disinflation that we're going to be heading down towards the Fed target over the course of the next 18 months, then it's a much more gradual uh, easing path. But nonetheless, I mean you know we're at you know we're at a point where you know, we're probably peaked peaked rates. And the Fed, you know, really has a challenge here because a body in motion stays in motion. But when the Fed stops tightening, if they actually do stop in June, which we think they will, it's hard, harder to defend that position. Staying on hold is actually going to be probably harder. The Fed themselves are basically saying, stop listening and expecting us to tell you what we're going to do at the next meeting. We're not there yet. We haven't gotten all of the data. And in the meantime, what we have seen is really a repudiation of the death of the dollar story in light of some of the debt ceiling debates. How long can that happen? The sense that the dollar will strengthen, even though there is concern about the U.S. defaulting on its obligations. Look, I mean, I think that the default uh, issue, you know, as long as we don't have like a miscalculation towards the last minute, there's been, uh, I think, enough sort of exploration around the idea that you know, we should avoid default, uh, even if it gets down to the wire. So I think that you know, the dollar is really taking its cue from a more of a medium term outlook, that the rest of the world is slowing, that you know, the China reopening was not as strong of a reopening as people expected, and that Europe had really the benefit of the weather at the beginning of the year, and Germany is slowing down, one of the fourth largest economies in the world, you know, not, not really growing. So I think that the, the dollar is both the view of, of both sides, you know, the, the, you know, the euro being a big part of the, of the DXY. You're seeing you know, dollar strength. And I get nervous about dollar strength, especially heading into the summer. We've seen you know, many times in the past where the dollar strengthening higher rates, it could still you know, create a risk off environment towards the end of the summer. How much more could it strengthen, given the fact that we just saw this data that was really stagflationary out of the U.S., uh, out of uh, Europe, I should say? Perhaps we get something similar in the U.S. Uh, in just a couple of hours here. Do you think that you could see further dollar strengthening and perhaps the sense that the euro has gotten overplayed with a recovery in China that's kind of losing steam a little bit? 
Yeah, I think that's spot on. I mean, that's the whole point. I think that we had this narrative at the beginning of the year that you know, even with the Fed being done, you can still have a strong dollar. You don't have to see that, you know, just be purely based on interest rate parity. This could be now you know, the dollar shortage story, the, the fact that we, it's still the reserve currency as much as people want to downplay it, uh, and that there is a need for dollars to, to, to transact. So I think that that plus, you know, just, you know, the overall economy weakening globally could give the dollar some, some strength here. Euro dollar right now, just breaking down. Session lows, negative 0.3%. George, thanks for being with us, mate, as always. George Goncarvis there of MUFG breaking things down for you on both the Europe side, Euro side of the trade, dollar side of the trade as well. Data in Europe just hasn't been great over the last couple of weeks. You see that in the surprise index. You can see that in the currency as well over the last are, few weeks or so. Are they having a debate over sticky inflation? My perception is the inflation in Europe is so entrenched, they're not to a sticky debate. It's just plain and simple. Hi. The ECB has got work to do. Yeah, it's, And the it's ECB a whole will tell debate. you that them, themselves. They want well, to go further. Yeah, I mean, there was a, there was a couple of days ago, Lagarde came out with a set of headlines, and it was like a completely separate thing from the debate in America. And to me, you know, going into June, it's really too stark and different. Yeah, debates. the Federal Reserve a little bit further down the road. Yeah. I think most people <clears throat> would tell you, Tom. Just getting some numbers that feel a little bit Home Depot-y over at Lowe's. Full-year comp sales, looking for that to come in at minus 2 to minus 4% over at Lowe's. They had seen <clears throat> negative 2 to flat. The estimate was negative no. 1.92. Just the range for EPS for the year ahead, 1320 to 1360. They had seen 1360 to $14. I'm going to go Jim Bianco on you here. He was talking about how retail sales are in inflation added sales when you adjust for inflation retail is not as good and there's a headline from Lowe's competing with Home Depot first quarter comps hurt by lumber deflation yeah unfavorable weather they all face that but lumber deflation figures into the top line and that's how you come in and you get a more challenging comp study. Lisa, the stock is down by a little more than 3%. I love the Home Depot is now an adjective uh, somehow, and I plan <laughs> to use that in my daily life quite frequently. Man, just stop it. Cut it out there, kid. That's Home Depot. -y. No, but this is really the issue. Is this really just a home improvement story, or is this something broader? Is this just that people piled into their homes, mm. brought them, upgraded them, and now they're flying around the world and going for experiences and neglecting their homes? It's down. like the pull forward in demand that we saw in the tech sector. There we saw go. in home improvement as well. Nice. Greg Valier is going to join us shortly of AGF Investments on the debt ceiling. He's got some saving words about just how much time is left here. He doesn't think there's much time at all. Yields a little bit higher by two or three basis points on a 10-year. Yields up again in the equity market. Futures a bit softer from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. On Capitol Hill, there's still no deal on the debt limit, but the two sides are sounding optimistic. President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy met at the White House Monday night. They called their talks productive and promised to keep negotiating. The president said both he and McCarthy have agreed that a default is, quote, off the table. Russia is presuming other countries, including India, is pressuring them behind the scenes. Now the Kremlin is threatening to upend defense and energy deals unless they help block expected moves aimed at punishing Russia over its invasion of Ukraine. Documents seen by Bloomberg show Ukraine wants the Financial Action Task Force to add Moscow to its so-called blacklist or gray list. That would put Vladimir Putin's government in the same company as North Korea, Iran and Myanmar. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has won the support of nationalist rival, boosting his bid to extend his rule. The long-shot third candidate, Sinan Owan, has asked his supporters to back Erdogan in Sunday's runoff. Owan was eliminated from the first round of balloting, with just 5% of voters backing his candidacy. Erdogan led the earlier vote, but fell short of the 50% majority needed for an outright win. Walgreens has reached a tentative settlement with consumers who said the drugstore giant was, quote, willfully blind to fraud at blood testing startup Theranos. Consumers in Arizona and California had alleged Walgreens offered the company's blood tests at its stores, even while it had good reason to suspect Theranos' technology didn't really work. The founder of Theranos and its former president are both serving prison time for fraud. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. We both 
talked about the need for a bipartisan agreement. We have to be in a position where we can sell it to our constituencies. We're pretty well divided in the House, almost down the middle, and it's not any different in the Senate. And so we got to get something to sell on both sides. I felt we had a productive uh, discussion. We don't have an agreement yet, but I, I did feel the discussion was productive in areas that we have differences of opinion. Say the word productive a few more times, we might believe you. Plenty of happy talk <laughs> from President Biden and the House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Let's get straight to the numbers. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen issuing another warning to lawmakers. We estimate that it is highly likely that Treasury will no longer be able to satisfy all of the government's obligations if Congress has not acted to raise or suspend the debt limit by early June and potentially as early as June 1. Greg Valliere of AGF Investment writing the following. If the X date really is June 1, we're in trouble because there simply may not be enough time to write the deal into legislative language, then give lawmakers time to actually read it. If the X date is around June 6th or 7th, there may be time to reach an agreement. TK, pretty scathing from Greg this morning. Get out the calendar and someone that's known the calendar of Washington for decades and decades. Mr. Vallier briefs us this morning here on May 23rd. Um, I've been calling it next week, Tuesday, somewhere in the zeitgeist last night, Greg Vallier. I saw people talking about next week is suddenly upon us. Is it? Yeah, we're, we're getting there, Tom. I've been very negative, as you know, but I think that the caps, these spending caps are really crucial. The Democrats have agreed to a spending freeze. That's a big deal. So I, I think we, we're we not going to default. However, a big, a big caveat, I don't think they can get it done in time. I think there's going to have to be an extension of a week or two because uh, there's a lot of members in both parties who need to be uh, persuaded. But we're getting there. We're getting a little bit closer. Which can kick down the road is best for Americans? Is it a shorter term one where they fix this in two weeks? Or do we want a can kick down the road into, say, September? You really don't want to go into September, Tom. I think that's that's going to be annoying to the markets. The, the longer this thing sits out in the sun, the more it's going to attract flies. So I, I think that we've got to get something done. And I think it can be done, but there's going to probably have to be a short-term extension. It's definitely already annoying to markets and far beyond. And it seems like there's been a shift in rhetoric away from uh, job voting the other side with fiery threats of a default, so something of a nature reflecting the fact that nobody wants to have the U.S. default. Is this a political shift on both sides to basically say, look, we're not going to do this. We're not holding the U.S. hostage. We're just trying to negotiate in good faith. Well, I think there's a, a growing feeling on Capitol Hill. This could be a pox on both your houses. If we don't get anything, I think the level of disgust toward Congress will increase if that's possible. So, no, I think both sides want to get this done. Both sides genuinely do not want to see a default. What is annoying to me is that at the very last minute, they brought up revenues. We're going to talk about taxes now. That, that seems to be an issue that just complicates things. Let's talk about that, especially given the fact that tax receipts, tax uh, income this year was so far below what the U.S. was expecting, part of the reason why the X date perhaps is a bit earlier than other people had been projecting. Is this because of a lack of investment in the IRS? Is this because of loopholes? Is this because of tax code? Or simply because the economy isn't doing as well as people had previously thought? Well, there are a lot of variables, Lisa. I, I, I would say that the, the one that could snag this whole thing is a proposal to cut back dramatically on the IRS funding, as you mentioned. If they did that, uh, that could drag this thing well into the summer. But I, I'd say they're, they're there. They probably have at least half of the deal done. Uh, so the, the, the odds in continue to improve slightly that we'll get a deal in a week or two. What happened to all of the intransigent members of both parties, basically the ones on the right who have been saying we're not going to pass any kind of increase in the debt limit, we're going to mandate all sorts of cutting over our dead bodies? That was sort of the platform that they ran on. And then on the, on the other side, people pushing back on Biden and saying, why are you even negotiating? You're giving in far too much and you're looking weak. How much are you seeing those two sides willing to come to the table and actually vote for a plan that is hashed out between McCarthy and Biden? It's a really good point, and it's a big wild card right now that couldn't both parties hold their members. I think McCarthy's done a pretty good job at holding Republicans. I think a lot of Democrats don't want to be seen as uh, 
you know, c contrasting right. with Joe Biden. So I'd, I, I'd mm. say in both parties, there's a, re a resignation that they're going to have to get this done. Hey, Greg, I want to segue here. I was thunderstruck yeah. in the early, early morning yesterday of the Telegraph of London having as its lead headline the op-ed from the Washington Post on elderly presidents, of course, led by President Biden, the study that the Washington Post did. What was the ramifications inside the Beltway of the Post study of many older presidents? Well, I think a lot of people think this has been overdone, but we see overnight Hillary Clinton, who is uh, late 70s, saying that, yes, I understand uh, Joe Biden is real old and this could be uh, a liability. You know, it's an issue that is not going to go away. But as I point out to people, Donald Trump has a birthday in about a month. He turns 77. Greg, don't you think, though, this is just a way of avoiding the actual elephant in the room? It's not about age. It's about mental acuity. Why don't we actually have that yep. discussion? Not all 70-year-olds are created equally. Not all 80-year-olds yep. are created equally. In fact, I know some 90-year-olds who are as sharp as some of the 60-year-olds that I know. Greg, why aren't we having a proper conversation about this topic? Well, you're right, and you guys mentioned a few minutes ago, Henry Kissinger turns 100 today, and he's still really sharp. So the, you're absolutely right, John. I think that's the big uh, issue. But it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a blunt object used against uh, Joe Biden whenever he says something inarticulate, whenever he looks frail. It's an issue he's not going to be able to avoid. Greg Valier of AGF Investments. Greg, thank you. Appreciate it, sir. TK, I just think that people seem to be happy right now to have this conversation. 80, it's really old. I actually think that's quite offensive. Really, the conversation we should be having, is the sitting president fit enough to run for another term? Does he have the mental we, we acuity have, to run yeah. for another term? We have a distant history of that. Woodrow Wilson, Reagan failing, George Bush Sr. failing, many would say, is, well, and my guess is as we get closer to the election, we'll shift. We'll shift from an age study to... How, whoever the two candidates are. Can What's he campaign? Look, Tom, back in the campaign, the previous <clears throat> campaign, and we've talked about this a, a million times, he didn't really have to campaign. In fact, the campaign strategy wasn't to. Yeah. That, was the, that was the thing. Stay away, make this a referendum on the sitting president. The big test of this president is going to be whether he can actually go out there and campaign in a way that he did not in the previous I mean, election. Lisa, do we observe it yet? I don't think we observe him campaigning yet, really. We have observed him more public, though, and having more events yeah. and being and more And he made present. jokes about it at the White House dinner. But know? this is the question, you know, how do you maintain momentum? This is a grueling schedule for anyone, let alone, uh, you know, someone who is, you know, more senior. And honestly, this is, this is the issue, especially, I was thinking about this yesterday. He flew back from Asia. He flew back from Japan and then had to re, uh, restart negotiations. No wonder it was at 5.30 p.m. No wonder it wasn't at 8 a.m. in the morning, because how could anyone be functional at that point? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, that's for sure. We'll pick up on this conversation, no doubt, again, maybe this morning, because Tom seems to like talking about it. You bring it up a lot. Well, I, I think the Washington Post article yesterday was huge. Well, let me make clear, this was positioned as an opinion piece. It was an editorial. It was not like reporting. It was an editorial from the Washington Post. And again, it was, they clearly made every effort not to make it just about President Biden. They had fancy charts of pres, you know presidencies going back for decades and decades. But nevertheless, there it was. And I was thunderstruck. The Telegraph in London picked it up. Boom, right at the top of the masthead. It's a big topic. It's yeah. a big topic. But I just think that you need a little bit more detail than simply saying the president is age X. The issue here is whether you think he has the mental acuity or not. Yeah. And that's what's been coming up in the polls. That's, that's the issue at play here. You can be a young 80-year-old. You can be a young 70-year-old. You can be a very old 60-year-old. My dad beats me in tennis all the time. Uh, there you go. How old is he now? He's in his 80s. He's crushing it, <laughs> yes. right? We need to go a little bit further. Liz Ann Saunders is going to join us shortly from Charles Schwab. Looking forward to that conversation. Equities, just a little softer here from New York. This is Bloomberg. Equities on the S&P 500, a little lighter, softer, lower, negative by 0.1%. The real story, though, is in the Nasdaq, isn't it? What a run we've seen. March 10th, if you go back to March 10th, so that's a couple of days after SVP starts blowing up, the Nasdaq 100's up 17% since then. 17, absolutely flying. And have a look in the bond market. Let's go through this together. Your two-year. Your two-year's <clears> had what? 
40, 50 basis really point moving. move. 50 basis There's point something move going over on the here. last seven days and still climbing this morning, Tom, up another seven basis points. Yeah, you mentioned 4.40. I thought you were reaching for it. Boom. Uh, we're there. John, I, I mean, we got to explain this right now. We're going to take a couple minutes, folks. This is too, too critical to go to. If you still beat, doing a market if check. You beat, I don't care. We're, if you beat Middle, <laughs> John, if you beat Middlesbrough one to nothing and you go to Wembley. Yeah. This is like, folks, this is a huge deal. And John lived this as a kid trying to make the sky blue, right? Tried to. Didn't quite make well, it. Many of us try to. Was a teenager. And Others it talk didn't about it. You tried to do it. Went on trial. They were a Premier League club at the time. Some of my friends were there. They did make it. And they were fantastic football players. But the next level <clears> up, you can be the best player in your school, but be the best player at that kind of yeah. at that kind of standard and then be the best player after that. You've got to be supremely talented and incredibly dedicated too. And let's say I lack the dedication. <laughs> and they're gonna have to I mean, John they, John, they're gonna have forty thousand tickets. They go into Wembley. Yeah. It's for the championship league. And if they win, then they play Manchester City and the Tots and it's that a next playoff year. to get into the Premier League and you get serious money. Serious, serious money. Each player or just the, the, the team. I'm not sure what the bonus yeah. the bonus agreement is with each player, but certainly the team gets a serious pool of money to try and compete at the highest level. And then you've got a decision to make as a club. <clears throat> Do you chase the premiership and right. the title, just staying in the league by spending a lot of money to try and to do that? Yeah. Or do you try and do something a little bit more conservative? Because what you it, run the risk of doing is overspending, then dropping back down right, and struggling to right. get back up. I loved this weekend. I watched five minutes of somebody playing the bees, like Bournemouth or something. And it was this not in America, folks. You see this. It was like a minor league ballpark. You know, it was it was a tiny, tiny band by Dorset. It was a team that that I think came up last year. And you have this mega team of mega money playing in this little team with the fans right up against the front. That doesn't happen well, you in America. See what, what Highfield Road used to look like back in the day <clears throat> at Coventry City, which was the old stadium and unfortunately got knocked down. But that was right in the middle of the housing estate, right in the middle. It was a very cool walk. I remember my first game there. Have my you ever done the down thing Highfield where you... Road to watch, I think, Manchester United Coventry. And, and, but they're going to go into Wembley, I think it's this Friday, right? And it's like it's this 70, weekend. 80, 000 people. If I knew we were going to have this conversation, I might have prepared for it. Oh, no, but, um, well, we can't be prepared. You said we're not having this conversation. I just said, yeah, we're going to have this conversation because it's the sky blues. Okay, thanks for that. You're a Sky Blue supporter now. I am a Sky Blue supporter. Is well, right? it's tough. I look at QPR and I'm like, I don't know, you know. Are you done with your data check? <clears throat> I, I wasn't done. Should well, I finish just get, the data check the Euro? <laughs> before we go to Fran. Finish okay. the data check. <laughs> Thank you. Let's fit in the Euro. I promise to talk about Coventry City a little bit later this week. In the FX market, a Euro. There we go. A breakdown, a session low. Big breakdown. TK 107.73 with negative 0.4%. Someone watching the Euro breakdown, of course, is Francine Lacroix from London, but now from Qatar, with her an important conversation on American and global finance at the Qatar Economic Forum. Francine Lacroix. Thank you so much, Tom. I am absolutely delighted to be joined by Ken Mullis for a robust conversation on the economy. It's a little bit noisy. Everyone's having their coffee. I don't know whether there's a lot of noise on inflation or how your view, Ken, has changed on the U.S. economy in the past months. Well, it's pretty much stayed the same. I think we're, we're still fighting inflation. It, it's interesting to me because everybody's focused on the Federal Reserve. I was just right. talking to somebody about the last time we had inflation, there was a big debate called guns and butter. I don't know how many people remember that, but the United States was in the Vietnam War, and, the, and, and there was really a lot of choices to be made and, and how inflationary a war environment is. And I do think people are underestimating how inflationary it is to conduct policy at home and, yeah. and, and fund the war. And I do think that inflation's going to stay higher for longer. And the Fed's, I don't think the Fed's easing so quick. So no, no cuts from the Fed is what you're expecting? Are you? I expect the Fed might be continue to be aggressive and at least higher for longer. Are you expecting some kind of credit crunch? Look, I think credit's tough out there. Um, cost of money's gone up. It's hard to get credit. I think it's going to continue to be hard for a while. Yes, I don't know if it'll be a credit crunch, but it's difficult. Ken, Ken what do you worry most about in the markets right now? I think the um, probably just the continuation. I, I, I do think we need to find a. I think the continuation of the war is something in the background. It's just not front and center in the conversation. And what I was trying to point out is 
It was interesting in the 70s when we had inflation, it was it was the topic. The interesting part to me is that no one's even discussing it as a fundamental driver of fiscal policy that results in inflation. And I think I think it's one of those things that needs to be, you know, it, it, it's going to continue to drive drive inflation. How much should we worry about the debt ceiling? Not, not as much as everybody here wants to. Okay. I think it's a great news item, and I think it's like watching any great negotiation. Again, maybe my background is an M&A banker. Look, no deal gets done until everybody walks away from the table at least once. And so we're doing that in a global environment with a lot of media. But I, I do think sooner or later the debt ceiling will be yesterday's news. Ken, when you look at some of the big pictures, it can be AI. Are, are your bankers using ChatGPT? How will that change the way that you invest? Right now we're actually blocking ChatGPT. Just because you have to be careful about as you put information into the system, it actually becomes part of the system. So there's a lot that has to happen for us to get uh, use out of it. But obviously ChatGPT and all AI is going to change a lot of things. A, a lot of things or everything? Is it too soon to say how much it will change and at what pace? Yeah, no, I think it'll be like all things in tech. I look back and I've been shocked every time at the, at the curve. Um, and how quickly things get adopted and how much change happens. Yeah. I suspect there'll be a significant amount of change from AI. Um, Ken, talk to me a little bit about SVB. So you, you've put in people, right, in, in your company from SVB. Are you expecting to do the same with Credit Suisse? I thought you were asking me about SUVs for a second. SUV, no, <laughs> SVBs. SVBs. <laughs> it's so noisy. <laughs> Look, we, you know, it's, it's wonderful. Just when things are difficult are the time when you have to make big moves in life. Yeah. And, and they, it's funny, the great opportunities don't come when you want them to. They come because something happened. So when SVB uh, had their issue, we moved that weekend. And we saw their tech team as a spectacular opportunity for us. And we hired about 12 managing directors out of the group. Now, the M&A environment isn't perfect, but I don't think that would have become available in a perfect environment. So we're building for the next five, ten years. But so is that a space that you will grow, basically, what oh, yeah. SVB was doing? How big will it get? Well, it doubled the size of our tech footprint. Mm -hmm. uh, it fit like a glove. Really, there was almost no overlap. It was, uh, we knew the people. We had, we had literally tried to hire them before SVB did. Okay. And so we knew them. We knew they were our culture. Mm -hmm. We knew the overlap was perfect for us. Mm -hmm. Look, the tech fee pool is the biggest fee pool in the world right now, even for private equity. I think software alone might be the biggest fee pool. And uh, out of those 12 MDs, I think seven of them were uh, on software. So we look forward to really, uh, you know, it, it doubles our footprint in the tech world. Are, are you looking to hire anyone from Curtis Suisse? Does it present, the, you know, similar opportunities? It's a, it's a big talent pool. It's different, though. Uh, we did hire, we did announce one hire uh, in the industrial business from CS, and, and we are looking at that more as a, a one-off opportunity as people decide. But SVB was, for us, very unique yeah. in how deep they were, how organized they were. It's a, it was a team that understood each other, worked together for many years, so it was a really good opportunity to do something significant. And can more than the crypto meltdowns, because that also, I imagine, you know, bring hiring opportunities from some of the juniors. Crypto, we've been big, you know, we've been doing our restructuring group. We have one of the leading restructuring groups in the world, and we've been involved in almost all the crypto restructuring. But I don't know how much more there really is to go on that. I, um, I you know, I think there was a big wave post FTX. Yeah. Um, you know, we have a group, we are dedicated to blockchain and we cover it. But this, this tech team we took out of SVB was much more towards yeah. software um, and, and you know, direct tech. Um, given everything that we've talked about here at the conference and we've just talked about, how do you think your firm will change in the next two years? What will you focus on? What part of the business do you think will grow significantly? Well, you know, I believe this is, this is a big spring almost waiting to uncoil. The, the M&A market's been in a recession. Everybody asks me, is, uh, is the economy going to go into a recession? Well, I'll tell you, the M&A market's been in recession for about 14 or 15 months. Yeah. And the inventory of the transactions doesn't go bad. It doesn't spoil. It's not like, uh, you know, it doesn't go away. And I think when the Fed stops, when we have some clarity, and I don't know if that'll be a month, a quarter, six months, but when it comes back, the M&A market will come back yeah. strong. Um, and we're just preparing for yeah. that. 
We think we're unlevered. Yeah. And we have a great opportunity to build the company in this downturn. Ken, there's a lot of money in this region, and I know that there were, you know, reports that you were involved with a possible takeover, standard charger, of, of a Middle Eastern investor. Do you think that there will be more opportunities like that? Middle Eastern investors looking for, you know, large, systemically important banks. Well, I won't comment on any specific deal, but I will say, when you come here, and I encourage everybody who hasn't been. It's optimistic, it's energetic, it's pro-business. And the enthusiasm and optimism and desire to grow the region is, is, is really invigorating. Um, and yes, I believe the region has a bright future and is almost on the opposite cycle of the West right now. They're, they're, yeah. they're looking forward. It, yeah, it, it helps having deep pockets because of the energy complex. Yeah, Ken, it does. Thank you so much for joining us. That was, of course, Ken Mullis of Mullison Company. With that, Tom, and John and Lisa, I'm going to send it back to you in New York. Francine Lacroix, thank you so much. There was an important discussion on the events of the moment with Mr. Mullis. Uh, Important to see. Then this comes, John, off Green Hill in Mizuho yesterday, and uh, you know each of these firms is different. It's all about the people, and it's you know it's, all, it's people to people, and you know someone like Shanali Basic really keeps score of the manpower and who's moving here, moves moving there. But the the Green Hill transaction yesterday was something after their collapse from eighty to I'm going to say ten dollars a share. From 2010. It's some consolidation, Tom, and I think we should be clear. Certain parts of the banking universe are doing okay right now. Net interest income, JP Morgan racing the outlook, other parts not so good. Yeah. Think corporate banking, MA, TK. Yeah. Beyond the MA we have seen, that's been a soft patch for some of these banks. Did, did Jamie Dimon talk succession yesterday? Did Bramwell get a video? Five in year there? plan. Five year plan. Isn't it usually five more <laughs> yeah. years? Although five more years. This time he said three and a half. He said, I think he said the corporate team, the executive team had intensity still. They had intensity. <laughs> He's not seven now. If, we've, got, we've got intensity around this table. <laughs> Savita Subramanian with Bank of America in the next hour on her upgrade to her outlook coming up shortly. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Qatar Airways is beefing up its presence across much of the world as it continues to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. CEO Akbar Al-Baker Al spoke exclusively with Bloomberg's Manis Cranny on the sidelines of the Qatar Economic Forum in Doha. Now that uh, we are ramping up, we are introducing new routes in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, and of course going back uh, big time into China. Albacher says ticket prices will continue to be higher, and he said the airline will wait and see before ordering new planes. Ukraine cannot win the war against Russia. That today from Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, who spoke with Bloomberg Editor-in-Chief John Micklethwaite at the Qatar Economic Forum. Now, Orban said with NATO not ready to send troops, quote, there is no chance for poor Ukrainians to win this war. Hungary is blocking a further $540 million installment of European Union financial aid to Ukraine. It also poses new sanctions against Russia. BlackRock favors private credit over public as the banking sector turmoil makes traditional lenders cautious. BlackRock strategists say that private credit could help fill a void left by banks pulling back on some lending and offer potentially attractive yields to investors. Private credit has been booming as lending conditions turn tight in the wake of Silicon Valley Bank's failure and Credit Suisse's shakeup. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. We're already seeing credit tightening up because, you know, the easiest way for a bank to retain capital is not to make your next loan. So I think you are going to see that. And I think everyone should be prepared for rates going higher from here. You know, that if that 5% is not enough in Fed funds, if I, and I've been advising this to clients and banks, you should be prepared for 6, 7. Jamie Dimon, JP Morgan CEO at the investor meeting yesterday with a lot of things to say about higher interest rates. I can tell you that Marco Kalanovic and the investment bank at JP Morgan yeah, I read that. has a lot yeah. to say about risk aversion right now. They raised their cash allocation in their model portfolio by 2%, funded by reducing their weighting to equities and to corporate bonds. Listen to this shift in the commodities, rotating from energy, the reasons being recession risks and potentially a fading China growth impulse, to guess what, Tom? To gold. 
from energy to I gold saw that at the bottom. in commodities. Yeah, Interesting. Yeah. I saw that, and you're seeing that. Uh, um, Sarah Vellis at Deutsche Bank said the same thing today. He has a uh, within his ten ideas moving forward. Gold is uh, one of them. That's the first time I've heard that, folks. Mr. Diamond framing out: Is anyone ready for six percent interest rates? Maybe James Bullard is, and no one else. But that's the first commercial banker or strategist I've really heard talk about. Getting used to a six percent milieu, nobody's there. I think he said that also in 2014 and 2015. I'm just oh, speculating. No, no, that I don't disagree and with that. I think that's too. well said. I know. Yeah, it's well said. But preparing for higher rates as a bank executive is a little bit different to preparing for higher rates. Yes. As someone in the market, right? Yeah, as a strategist, I mean, it's it's a different thing. I running a bank an and running a portfolio are two yeah. but slightly we, different but, things. But we asked, you know, this is a pet peeve of mine. We love to talk to CEOs about macroeconomics. Sure. Which um, I've never really understood, even though Mr. Diamond's talked to us. Yeah, get an F-Fed You're a F-Fed big fan call. of that, I know. We talked to Lizanne Saunders about economics, and we folded into investments. She's chief investment strategist at Charles Schwab. She's been a great supporter of our effort. She joins us this morning. Lizanne Saunders, I want you to translate for people with a little bit longer term time frame what to do with the focus on net shorts. I want to talk about Saunders and the net shorts right now. There's a bet that we're going down, isn't there? There is, but it's interesting. There, there are times where extreme positioning or sentiment indicators suggest a, a contrarian move, but the, but the net position in terms of some of the larger speculators although it does tend to result in choppiness in the shorter-term time frame, it's not a clear contrary indicator for a longer-term uh, time frame. In fact, what it potentially sets up is, is short covering, which we've seen throughout this year. But, but yeah, there are certainly those yeah. in the institutional speculators crowd that are betting – um, that uh, something could happen here. Maybe it's, you know, could be debt ceiling related. Out there somewhere, someone's going to walk into Charles Schwab today and they're going to have huge gains in seven stocks that have gone up. Maybe let's <laughs> just pick on Apple just for the sake of it. Do you sell your Apple shares? Do you hedge them out? What do you do? Do you hold them and do something else? What is the prescription for people, heaven forbid, that have large gains? All right. Well, I'm not, I, I won't speak specifically about sure. Apple because you guys know I don't cover individual stocks. But yeah. The concentration is extraordinary, and I think it's a function of the banking crisis, because if you look at that bias up to the largest cap names, you know, the mega cap eight, that occurred almost exactly to the day with when Silicon Valley Bank failed. So I think there was that sort of macro, let's go into these highly liquid, stronger cash flow type of names, but I think there's also an AI component to that shift. I think you have to be careful about wholesale selling, but be mindful of concentration risk and the possibility that at some point you see some convergence in terms of the remaining 492 names and the the mega cap eight. It can last for a while, but I think this is where you maybe kick in rebalancing uh, with a little bit more frequency as opposed to waiting, say, for some calendar point in time. Does this convergence point to actually higher highs, basically that if the rest of the stocks have been left behind and they catch up with the concentration of the big winners, well, that's up. That's the ideal uh, scenario is that you get catch up by the remaining stocks as opposed to catch down. If you keep in mind, as we headed into 2022, so 2021 was a strong year on the surface. You had no more than a 5% uh, drop by the S&P 500. That set up convergence with the biggest names catching down to the weaker names. Fast forward to the latter part of last year, October 2022, even though the indexes took out their June low, under the surface you had seen better breath. And I know we talked about that on this program. That, I think, is what carried us into the beginning of this year. And unfortunately, that concentration has picked back up again. The much better scenario, obviously, is if we start to see better performance, better breath under the surface. We're just not quite there yet. And sometimes, by the way, the convergence can happen in both directions. Yeah. You can get some pullback at the um, higher cap end, 
while you start to see some greater participation by uh, by the average stock. The biggest confusion that I have right now looking at the market is I'm looking at expectations where Fed, where, uh, Fed rates are going to be in about a year or less than a year by January of next year, back before SVB collapsed, before people were worried about some sort of banking crisis. It was 5.4 percent come January. Right now, you're looking at about 4.5 percent, even with people writing off the likelihood of a banking crisis, saying it isn't a crisis. If it was, it's over. How do you reconcile these two ideas? I, I, it's hard to reconcile it. I think that there's something very odd about the narrative around rate cuts kicking in in the second half of this year, all else equal. To your point, Lisa, not having uh, a significant spike in the turmoil in the banking system, let's even assume disinflation continues, the likelihood of it getting to or near the Fed's target in short order relatively stable labor market and an okay economy. It's certainly possible the Fed could be cutting rates in the second part of this year, but not all else equal. The only reason I think where they would see a green light to start cutting rates would be either much more turmoil in the banking system or a much bigger hit to the economy, inclusive in particular of the labor market. Other than that, they're going to be in pause mode. Uh, Lizanne Saunders, Ben Laidler of eToro, does a terrific piece today on volume. He's not a big fan of studying volume. He says it's really not linked to performance. I happen to be, full disclosure folks, in the same belief. Do you care about volume and that it's so quiescent right now? Um, I'm I'm in your camp uh, as well. I I don't think volume. I think volume in um, in decades past when – the structure of the market was quite a bit different, um, probably had some value in wrapping into your technical analysis. It's just not something I focus uh, to a significant degree on because of just how the market environment has changed. So I, I don't I don't put a lot of weight on it. Brilliant, Lizanne, as always. Hope to see you in the studio soon. Lizanne Saunders there Ditto. of Charles Schwab. Thank you. Thank you very much. Such a big range of views out there at the moment on the equity market. In about 10 minutes' time, we'll catch up with one of our favourites, Gillian Emanuel of Evercore, around the table with us, not just on equities, but on this Fed as well. Of this Federal Reserve, don't call it a pause, seems to be the communication you're getting from the likes of Neil Kashgari, the president of Minneapolis. Yeah, I think right now it's a close call. Either way, versus raising another time in June or skipping... There's that word. What, is, what does that What's mean? What's important to me is not signalling that we're done. If you say pause, the market hears cuts because ultimately I, they think Matt the next Luzzetti move after that Deutsche Banks is a rate same cut. Thing. Yes. So Kashgari wants to make the point that we might skip, take a break from hike in interest rates, and then it's conditional on the data. Do we hike again? How much do we need to hike? Bullard says a couple more times before year end. I think they want to keep it open and conditional because they know that if they start to say pause, this market's going to lean harder into cuts, and that's not what they want to signal. And there is a difference between what they think they're going to do, Lisa. And you said this, I've said it, Tom said it. There's a difference between what they think they're going to do and what they want to signal. And those two things could be different. Maybe they do think they might have to cut later this year, but at this point in time, they don't want to signal that. Taking a step back, the reason why this is so important is effectively you've seen a loosening in credit conditions since SVB collapsed. If you just take a look at forward expectations for rates, they have come down by a full percentage point. Given that, how do they raise the expected rates in markets without doing anything, right? Just through their rhetoric at a time when they've basically been saying, we don't know. This is a really difficult sort of uh, needle to thread. And that's the reason why you're getting these sort of tortured skip pause, you know, what are we going to call it, et cetera. The data's going to either show it or not. Yep. And they're going to have to come out and explain, look, you guys are wrong. And these are the reasons why in a more comprehensive way. It's June 2nd for payrolls, June 13th for CPI. And we've also got to work through this debt ceiling mess, Tom, down in Washington, D.C., as well. That continues up until the middle yeah, of June. I, yeah. Then all of a sudden you're in the blackout I, period. I you agree. can't communicate yeah. unless you make a little call to the Wall Street Journal. In so your... Gonna, then, you know, yeah, then, oh, you know. John. Anyone in particular? They don't do that. Come on. In your defense, <laughs> Merriam-Webster doesn't conflate pause and skip. In, I did not expect to see that. That's very important. That's official skip now. Skip is discreet <laughs> from pause. That's, that's official now. Merriam-Webster We're going to skip. That's what they're doing on the committee yeah, of the Federal exactly. Reserve at the moment. They're skip. <laughs> With a dictionary. Pause. Yeah. Dictionary. Uh. Judy Emanuel coming up of Evercore. That's up next.
it seems to be we're set for the Fed to pause in June, and I would expect that to be the case. Our view is for economic deterioration. It's kind of a slow burn. A certain amount of pricing power has accrued to corporates, and that's the part of inflation that will be, you know, relatively sticky. We still generally like non-U.S. markets for the U.S. because we still think the U.S. is on the more expensive side. We have the first cut penciled in for March of 2024, so we still have quite a ways to go before we get that first cut. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Waking up to the smell of debt ceiling optimism. Nothing better than that. From New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. The side eye from Bramo that I just received. <laughs> Piercing. With Tom Keen, Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market just about unchanged on the S&P 500. Lisa, talks were productive. This is good, Tom. Productive talks between Speaker McCarthy and the president of the I think United they States. were, and the thing I go back to, John, on this, and I'll say this a million times, you look at all the idiocy debt things over the years. We have a president who has miles of legislative experience, and he's just grinning and smiling and hanging out, and that's all part of the ballot. We're, we're looking at it like, are you kidding me? And yet that is the ballot. Elisa side eye is how everybody feels about this. <laughs> well, I mean, right come now. on. Agreed. You say, you know, the smell, waking up to the smell of debt ceiling is basically get back to bed because it's not going to change I, I, and mood music going either way look they are making progress in the talks we're not sure exactly all of the minutiae we have some sense of some of the requirements and some of the uh, machinations <clears throat> behind the scene but here's the ultimate question that we just don't know let's say biden and mccarthy come to a deal do the rank and file get on board exactly and then if they don't what happens because the debt ceiling limit well, the actual drop dead date is getting closer and closer uh, yeah and well closer, that and to me problem. is a point and that changed yesterday yesterday there was a shift in the winds i'll give them to give credit to the washington post can't remember but i'm sorry this is next week tuesday all of a sudden june 1st is here it's may 23rd i think if i do the math that's eight days eight days a week or something like that i'm with you some follow the say, calendar you know, follow the six. numbers 60 billion that's the cash balance of the Treasury right now. Is that the number we're down, working down, down. on? Down, down, down. That was the last read, the okay. last thing that I looked at. And here's the reality on the calendar. Greg Valliere, the last hour on Bloomberg Surveillance, mm -hmm. AGF Investments. If the X date really is June 1, which is what the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is starting to strongly imply now, it could be early June, that could be the real X date, we're in trouble. His words, Greg, because there simply may be not enough time to write the deal into legislative language, then give lawmakers time to actually read it. If the X date is around June 6th or 7th, Lisa, there may be time to reach an agreement. I think that just goes to show just how, how small, how narrow that window is right and now to make this happen. And that's why people are talking about a possible kicking up of the debt limit by about $100 billion to get some breathing room to try to negotiate this deal. If you take a look at T-bill yields, what the implication is, yes, it's an issue over the next one month, but eh, not a chance of default. Three months, eh, but six months seems to be the stress point, which is interesting given the kicketh of the Kenneth as Tom puts it. All these different little fights happening across the curve right now. The growth story further out, the T-bill story, the that. debt ceiling well, gangs. Well said, then on the two-year piece of it, you've just got this repricing higher around the Fed story too. TK, it gets more interesting, I think, in the last couple I, of weeks. I think that's a really important observation that we're not looking at like twos, tens. We're looking here, here, here. And what George Concalvo said about the three-month T-bill is, is the identifier is important. Two-year right now, just they about okay 440. I'm talk. Well said. That was nice. Thank you. In the equity market on the S&P 500, equity futures look a little something like this on the S&P. Currently negative 0.1%. Yields on a 10-year up, up and away over the last seven, eight days. Lisa, your 10-year right now, let's call it 375. Yeah, and partly because of some hawkish speak from uh, Fed officials. Today, we do get economic data in the U.S. following on to what we got over in Europe, including 9.45 a.m., the S&P Global U.S. Manufacturing Services PMIs, uh, manufacturing and services, I should say. The bifurcation that we saw in Europe, I'm very curious to see whether it continues here. We have seen the economic surprise index continue to inflect higher, a greater number of economic surprises to the upside. And I'm curious to see whether that continues. The Qatar Economic Forum is ongoing. Next up, we will be speaking uh, with with Bill Winters, which will be very interesting to hear, especially in light of the expansion into China by certain <clears throat> international banks. Also, Dave Calhoun of uh, Bo uh, Boeing. Also, today, we do get Fed speak. Dallas Fed President Lori Logan at 9 a.m. Will she also be uh, as hawkish as some of the speak that we've heard? Two more rate hikes from Jim Bullard. I know. There is no pause from Kashgari. No. Daily does not want to offer an outlook for the rest of the year. <laughs> yeah, how can you, you see where this is going? Her outlook yeah, exactly. When are the hearings on the bank failures? Well, well, yeah. That's her outlook. I know, I know. Here's a headline for you. Dick Sporting Goods would like to tell the world we are not Foot Locker. This is what they've <laughs> got to say. 
Adjusted EPS for the first quarter, 340. The estimate, 313. And Lisa, the outlook, they hold the outlook. They still see the same for for EPS for the year ahead. This is sort of the motley performance that we've seen of uh, different retailers, although a lot of retailers have come out uh, better than expected if they have a niche. Dick's Sporting Goods, you know, if you fish, if you hike, if you... Get outdoors. Get outdoors. This is you all know? the stuff that TK does on the weekend. Well, yeah, and honestly, so if you really want hiking boots, you go there, and then or hiking pants. I think that would be good too, and you can get that at Dick's Sporting Good or it's or a gun. sneakers from Prada. What are you talking about? <laughs> Jill and oh, Emmanuel. You think that's funny. Around the it's table. True. <laughs> Let's get to Julian from Evercore. Good morning, to you, Julian. Good morning. I give you two views. Bank of America constructive. <laughs> JP Morgan not at all. Where are you and the team right now? Somewhere in between. Uh, so think about it. Everything has been in between for the last seven months. Uh, this is one of these times, John, where the signal and the noise are incredibly difficult to parse and that there are times <coughs> where there just isn't that much information from the price. And what it comes down to is we are waiting to see if one year's worth of incredible, incredible tightening, I mean, really historic, is going to have the effect. And we're seeing you know, minor parts of that effect. So for us, uh, essentially, what it comes down to is we do expect a recession to begin sometime in the second half. And for the equity market, that means down first and then likely back up essentially to here. Take the Ed Hyman dynamics of a, a Hyman recession. It's in your note talking about some real gloom here into first quarter 2024 and also his call of dramatically lower inflation getting out there under 3%. And you've got SPX 4150. How are you going to frame equities forward given a Hyman recession and a Hyman disinflation? So that is where actually when you think about it the long term, which we as investors have been guilty of perhaps not thinking about, given the fact of these seven most difficult months uh, of sideways actions, the view 24 and 36 months out is literally unequivocally positive because of the fact that inflation is likely to fall below 3 percent sustainably. Have we worked through the stimulus, the $10 trillion stimulus during COVID? How far are we down in that? So if you look at in terms of, of the excess savings on the part of uh, consumers, you're really only about halfway through. Uh, and I think that, again, is, is one of these things that we fail to appreciate is, is this idea that there was so much money put into the system, both monetary and fiscal, that it's really still working its way through. And then the question is, and, and this is both given the market action, a glass half empty and a glass half full view. The glass half empty view is, my goodness, if we could have had that uh, banking uh, problems of the last several months in an environment where stimulus is still working through, maybe that's not so good. Glass half full is that the stimulus is so profound that it's going to engineer this adjustment that we've had. This is the, you know, the tale of two narratives, whatever you want to justify the, the data with. So how do you really work in an environment where you can basically come up with it, whatever story you want to? You might as well be happy and just go with stocks, right? Uh, look, w we think you need to stay invested. We think this is an alpha extraction time. And, uh, you know, defensive sectors ha have worked and then they've not worked. AI, as we all know, seems to be the overriding uh, principle right now. We, like uh, others of the last half hour, are concerned that there's too much concentration there. Uh, and we do think that there is a bit of catch down to do, uh, given the fact that small caps have underperformed the way they have. But you really need to stick to your ding. And the interesting thing about this environment is with rates where they are, if you want to hedge a portfolio, it's extremely cost efficient to do so. I've heard that before. So let's pick up on that point in just a moment. I just want to finish on the poor breath point. Is poor breath actually any indication of how much oxygen is left in a rally? Because I feel like people complained about the breadth of the stock market and the bull market of the last 10 years, and it carried on. Why can't this continue? Uh, well, look, so it can continue, provided that we get that sort of glide path in terms of the stimulus that we were talking about uh, a few minutes ago wearing off. It's just our view that, it, first of all, this whole rate cut talk, forget about it. Sure. Okay? They're not. So there is some repricing in our view that needs to occur based on that misperception that, that the market has. That has been happening, though, Julian. And I think what's interesting for me is that we've repriced yields higher at the front end, <clears throat> taken back some of those rate cuts, and this Nasdaq's still fine. So can you explain to me what the relationship is 
between what's developing in the bond market and what's happening in stocks? So the relationship is, again, this question of how, the time before the recession. Remember, uh, we've had a lot of excitement around AI in these last two or three months. And what uh, investors are sort of harping back to is the 1998 yield curve inversion. Uh, I saw something this morning that said, best start to the NASDAQ since 1998. Well, two things happened. First, you had a roaring bear market in 1998. And then if you got defensive, you gave up 300% gains in the NASDAQ over the next year and a half. So that's the conundrum that people face, and they don't want to let go. And that's perhaps the right decision. Your shop is going to do the most eagerly anticipated daily call in about 10 minutes with Mr. Hyman. I want you to coalesce here the message from your shop to people in cash scared stiff. So th the message is, is that it's okay to be in cash for now. But if you're thinking long term, you need to be prepared for that time where you need to shift assets. But that isn't coming until we get uh, inflation sustainably lower, which, again, the path to get there is through an economic slowdown. Julian, final question. You touched on it. I just want to squeeze it in. Optionality. Do you want to hedge to the upside, to the downside? Where do you want to take advantage of where things are priced at the moment? Well, that actually comes down to, you know, one's own portfolio. Look at your portfolio. Think about how you feel. And we always say for uh, the retail investor is when the market's going here, and we do think you're at the upper end of the range here. We don't think this is a breakout. But if you have FOMO, Options are cheap enough that you can buy upside in themes like the rest of the world. We actually prefer portfolio hedges with the S&P 500, where you can sell upside to finance downside, and it's very, as I said, cost -effective. There we go. Brilliant. Gillian, that was wonderful. Thank you, sir. Do you want to talk about a debt ceiling? Do you want to take a, take a pass? Pass. <laughs> <laughs> Gillian Emanuel of Evercore is going to run out of the building, because up next we're going to be talking about the debt ceiling. Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy on the latest in Washington, D.C., from New York City. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. On Capitol Hill, there's still no deal on the debt limit, but the two sides are sounding optimistic. President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy met at the White House Monday night. They called their talks productive and promised to keep negotiating. The president said both he and McCarthy have agreed that a default is, quote, off the table. Saudi Arabia's top energy official is issuing another warning to oil short sellers just over a week before the OPEC Plus alliance is due to meet. Energy Minister Prince Abdul Aziz bin Salman spoke at the Qatar Economic Forum in Doha today. Speculators, uh, like anything in any market, they are there to stay. Uh, I keep advising them that they will be ouching. They did ouch in April. The prince is famous for telling short sellers they would be left, quote, ouching like hell. The government of the state of Qatar is an underwriter of the Qatar Economic Forum, powered by Bloomberg. European allies are looking to speed up training for Ukrainian pilots on F-16 fighter jets. They aim to finalize plans as soon as June. That's according to Denmark's acting defense minister. He made the comments at a gathering of defense counterparts in Brussels after the U.S. gave its support. Shares of Julius Baer slumped the most in a year. The Swiss Wealth Management manager posted a weaker boost to its business than some analysts had expected after the turmoil at rival Credit Suisse. And the Zurich-based bank reported assets under management rose just 1% in the first four months, while net new money had a, quote, slow start at the beginning of the year as clients pared back risk. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. We both talked about the need for a bipartisan agreement. We have to be in a position where we can sell it to our constituencies. We're pretty well divided in the House, almost down the middle, and it's not any different in the Senate. And so we got to get something to sell on both sides. I felt we had a productive uh, discussion. We don't have an agreement yet, but I, I did feel the discussion was productive in areas that we have differences of opinion. It was productive. That's about your headline. Productive. Just about productive.
President Biden, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, following high-level talks around the debt ceiling yesterday afternoon. Kevin McCarthy there after those talks and President Biden just ahead of them. Here's Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen on the so-called X date. We estimate that it is highly likely that Treasury will no longer be able to satisfy all of the government's obligations if Congress has not acted to raise or suspend the debt limit by early June. And once again, just reinforcing this, that it could be potentially as early as June 1. And, Tom, if you really believe that it is that early, then we are really running out We're of there. time. We're running We're like out of time. there right now. Yeah, I agree. Something changed in the wind yesterday. And, frankly, do, do we all agree you heard it in the tone of the two protagonists yesterday? I thought, you know, it was more constructive. There was a sense that they did not win political points by jawboning the likelihood of default. And that has been a shift in rhetoric. Before it had been, look, if we have to make you default to get some sort of discipline, we will. That has been sort of eradicated, and there is a sense that that's not going to play well for anybody. One improvement that I've seen, one development that I personally appreciate, they do these talks after the market close, one. They're seemingly very sensitive to that. I've stopped hearing those stupid comments trying to encourage market turmoil to try and get their advantage and gain some leverage from that. I think that's sensible. So I think they are taking it very, very seriously with that in mind. But ultimately, they don't really know where the X date is. You've got a range. Tax receipts are really lumpy. Tom, you've got no idea what that looks like. And you can see it with the cash balance of the Treasury if you follow the chart. Just sort of skips all well, over the place you mentioned by this several is important. billion dollars. So you, we're down to about 60. We think it could be lower, right? It could be. That's the latest information that we've hey, got. Yeah. Who's got the greatest LinkedIn page of all, everybody we talk to? Who's that? Terry Haynes. Why is that? At the top, he has a photograph of the Hollywood Post-Gazette. The headline is Cata Catastrophe Scene, Crisis Looms. <laughs> what year is that? It's, I don't know. It's a year Evergreen. when he started in Washington. <laughs> yeah. Folks, you hate the guy on LinkedIn with 11 experiences. It takes three pages long. you got to click through it. And that would be Terrence Haynes, founder of Pangea Policy, with all sorts of legit <laughs> Washington experience. Not the blah, blah, blah of the modern cable networks, but actually somebody who's been in the room. Terry, I've been dying to speak to you. When things change in the wind as they are right now, what is, describe the legislative ballet between two legislative power brokers like McCarthy and Biden. What's the actual body language that goes on? Well, the body language here is that, you know, the principals are going to be the adults in the room uh, and staff is going to go bash out details and make uh, difficult choices. But importantly, I think what's probably going to go on this week is what didn't go on last week, which is that the principals are giving staff uh, fairly clear instructions and, uh, and you know, kind of trying to put actually put a deal together, whereas last week staff was kind of flailing on their own. So, uh, the principal's job here is to provide overall direction and uh, and understand that, you know, the parameters of a deal, uh, you know, the, one of the old Washington saws always is that uh, nothing's decided until everything's decided, but uh, try to put together the parameters of a, of a general deal. And, you know, my interpretation <clears throat> of this is now we're down to, to trying to figure out the pelts. Uh, in other words, what we're going to bring back to the purists to keep them on side. Well, that's right where I wanted to go. Lisa brought that up earlier. I'm going to steal some thunder from Lisa here, which is the purists that are out there. Are they part of this discussion on the left and on the right? Uh, they're being informed. But uh, but are they part of the discussion? No, they they had their moment last week, uh, I think, when what you saw from the progressives was concern that, you know, anything would be cut on domestic spending. And uh, that's when the whole 14th Amendment strategy rolled out, which is kind of curious. I mean, this is so important. You need to take power away from me, a legislator, and, you know, kind of do it yourself as opposed to, you know, the legislators doing their jobs. But and on the right, you know, they understood very well, I think, that uh, that, that the House bill that passed was going to be the high water mark. What they're looking for fundamentally is uh, acknowledgement from the administration that there's going to be some spending restraint, that at least we're going to start trying to turn the battleship around a little bit. And, uh, you know, my, my view of that is I think they'll be good with it. What's the likelihood, in your view, that we kick up uh, the debt ceiling limit, $100 billion, to give more breathing space so that the U.S. avoids a technical default? Um, you know, I think right now it's a little bit too early to 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 make that uh, to make that call, Lisa. Only because 
I think there's still enough time to do a deal. Uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, Ye Yellen's been busily uh, fuzzing up everything, in my view. Uh, first, it was a hard, the hard line was uh, June the 1st. And then, you know, we might not have enough money by June 15th. Then yesterday, they tried to walk that back because they understood that the impression they were giving, which is they had a lot more time. Uh, so, you know, the the signal that politicians are getting from the Treasury Department, and the White House is probably getting it first, frankly, is that uh, there's a little bit more time than June the 1st. Uh, so there's a, there's enough time to do a deal here. But as I said to markets last night, you're not going to get something before the end of the week at the earliest. Uh, both parties decide there's a little more, more time to milk things first. You, pe you talk to people who are in the market who wake up to the smell of debt ceiling negotiations happily, knowing that they get to have a, another sort of uh, mind-spinning <clears throat> exploration of this topic. How much are they actually paying attention in a new way over the past few days? Uh, I'd say not a lot. You know, people... Uh I, th I, I talk about this as wishing and hoping, and I don't mean that disparagingly, but, you know, there, there's a general sense that this has worked out, uh, this will work out because it's always worked out, and, you know, don't bother me with the details from those fools in Washington. Uh, but, you know, there's a subset of those who are legitimately worried, and, you know, since I've been uh, relatively bearish all along, I was calling six months ago, I was telling everybody there was going to be a 60-40 likelihood here uh, of a problem uh, by mid-year, and here we are at like 60-40, 70-30. So, uh, you know, they understand now that they have to pay attention, and they also understand that, of course, as always, there's money to be made and lost in the, uh, in, in the short-term turnover. Terry, can you help me understand just what the tell would be for someone like you, that things weren't going well? in the talks. Terry, because I think we're all used to, on programmes like this, reading the Fed speak, reading the tea leaves. We kind of know what yeah. they're talking about. But when it comes to the yeah. politicians down in Washington, for you, with the experience of this so many times, what would be the tell for you this week that this was falling apart? Uh, that there's some kind of hard line that there's... Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's out there in view right now. I mean, I don't think we're going to get there, but it's out there in view. This idea that, uh, that, that somehow we're also going to have to talk about revenue raising. Uh, you know, the, that's come up at the last minute. That's never what this was about. This is about, uh, you know, doing debt ceiling and, and trying to impose some spending discipline and, you know, what, uh, you know, what are some fairly modest parameters if we're not talking about doing, uh, uh, touching 60 to 70 percent of the overall uh, federal spend. We're not talking about very much. Secondly, uh, the president has been going back and forth by uh, accusing Republicans of draconian cuts and at the same time saying, in, in writing that he agreed, he, he, he proposed one trillion in spending cuts himself. So this is about a little bit of spending discipline. If if, uh, if the Democrats and then the president personally are going to continue to talk about revenue raising, which means more taxation, uh, <laughs> among other things, uh, you know that's going to go south. Hey Terry, wonderful to get you on. Come back soon, Terry Haynes. There of Pangea Policy. If you watched that little gathering with reporters and Speaker McCarthy yesterday following the meeting. He really ruled out new tax raising, new tax hikes. Mm. And someone asked about it and followed up, and he snapped back, were you not here for the earlier part of the Q&A session? TK, he's <sighs> very, very firm on, on what he thinks about that push. I got a letter from the IRS two days ago. They're revenue raising. <laughs> How did that go? <laughs> well, it was a small number. Thank you. It was not as painful as I expected. But they were, as, as Terry said, what is BS revenue raising? The McCarthy's I hear correct. You. Amanda yeah. Lyndon of BlackRock is going to join us very, very shortly from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Equity's doing OK here. Welcome to the program. On the S&P 500, on the Nasdaq, equity futures just about unchanged on the S&P, negative by, let's call it 0.1%. Likewise on the Nasdaq 100. The Nasdaq, what a run we've seen. Squeezing out another day of gains yesterday. Year to date, at more than 26% on the Nasdaq 100. Really? Quite a run. 26% When people were expecting date? this equity market to sell off in the front half of 2023. They were good times. In the bond market, <laughs> two-year, 10-year, 30-year, the two-year... Just the relentless grind in a two-year yield for, I think, eight straight sessions now on a two-year, up another seven basis points on a two-year, getting close to 440. So this is something like a 40, 50 basis point move 
over seven trading sessions. And Lisa, it keeps on going. Tentatively pricing out a regional banking crisis, basically trying to revert back to where we were. How much is that really what we're seeing? So right before SVB failed, we were at 5.08%, was it? Let's call it 5.1. And be, uh, be rewarding to people who want some yield, Tom. <laughs> The yield's there. Mr. Diamond and says look for 6%. Post-SVP. Right. And that's where we're heading, perhaps. Do you back. think maybe, really? Back towards five? No, because I, I think aggressive. people feels, feel like something's changed. But everything that's changed, evidently, is completely positive, at least with respect to stocks. So at something, something has to be amiss here. Either, you know, everything's changed oh, for the positive because we get immaculate disinflation from banks that are no longer... You know, we get to there. June 30, and John's talking about NASDAQ up 30%, up 28%, whatever. I mean, that's the topic of the year. Yeah, Everybody missed Topic it. of the year going into summer just, is this. What are you talking about? <clears throat> this right here in foreign exchange. For everyone who's booked a vacation to Europe this summer, this is what you want to see. 100%. A breakdown in the euro. 107 80. Not quite the parity st stuff of last summer, but ultimately... Uh, I looked at it. We'll take it. We'll take it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, look, I looked at it an hour ago, John, and actually it is a breakdown. Two standard deviations is 1.07, I think 1.4, and it's pretty much freeway to 105, not parity. Pushing but back against consensus. Euro to 105. Eating away at that dollar short in the FX market. Eating yeah. away at some of those price cuts. I think Kit Jukes of Sockchain called it a nibble, <clears throat> Lisa, of the rate cuts in the second half, and we've taken a nibble out of them. So talking about vacations in Europe, do you guys Yelp? Do you guys use Yelp ever? Well, no, no, but yeah, reviews, so I saw that. Sort of I've rant. never done a yeah. Yelp thing. To no? read or to write? Well, I either. Actually, I could see you writing that. Actually, I could see both of you writing them. Have you guys ever written a Yelp review? No. Maybe I did because someone offered me a discount if I did. <laughs> well, I'm I did once. <laughs> I'm talking about it because uh, there is some speculation that they're going to be purchased. This one activist investor is uh, going to deliver a letter to the board saying, please sell yourself. You could actually uh, get twice as much as you currently have. And those shares are popping almost 11 percent pre-market trading. So uh, a lot of people are yelping. And you are seeing at least uh, advertisers yelp by uh, going to them more. They reported a 13 percent increase in net revenues. Dick's Sporting Goods. Evidently, people who like sports are buying, and they're continuing to buy, those shares up 2.4 percent after uh, reporting better than expected, not doing, what was it, not Home Depot, Home Depoting it? They're not a footlocker, Dick's Sporting Goods, and Lowe's aren't a Home Depot. Correct. Well, and I'll get to Lowe's in one second. But uh, basically, uh, one thing that I thought was really interesting was the CEO came out and said, even as consumers face macroeconomic uncertainties, our athletes have continued to prioritize sport. Our athletes. So uh, Lowe's, meanwhile... Is that what they refer to their customers as? <laughs> athletes? Yes, that's, what, that's a direct quote. That's ridiculous. Our athletes I tried to have... Walk, is that what they do? I, Stop it. John, I tried to walk into their Broadway <laughs> store the other day and they wouldn't let me in. Stop it. Can you, <laughs> don't you, you, you are buy, not like, fishing rods from there? You could have... Fishing athletes. rods. Come on. You, you could have fishing <laughs> rods. You could have hiking boots. You could have sneakers. Athletes are continuing to shop at Dick's. Athletes. <laughs> Moving okay. on to Lowe's. Uh, yeah, we did see them cut its sales outlook, and so you are seeing those shares a bit lower as well, although perhaps not full, not, not going full Home Depot, but still, people aren't, aren't really, the, uh, the home improvement types aren't as country. devoted I, I love as it. the athletes. Well, you know, it's like the parents with children, you know, like <laughs> you're such an athlete, you're so special. I remember walking past the playground years ago, I'd just moved to New York, and I was overhearing the parents picking up the kids from school, and this kid was throwing stones at a bird. Have I told you this story before? <laughs> no. Great story. Kids throwing no, stones at a bird. that's terrible. This is what the mum did. <clears throat> this is American parenting right here. This is what the mum did. Don't do that, honey. Great shot, though. <laughs> okay, hold up. Don't that do is a that, very honey. specific. Shot, no, though. but that is Seriously. a specific incident. I that, once, was, that was the feedback. I once took my kids to the playground, and I saw a guy, a father, with his little son running laps around the entire playground. And the kid stops and he said, keep running. And I looked at him, he's like, nap time needs to happen today. <laughs> <laughs> so you get a flavor of everything. Quality, TK. It's a jockocracy, <laughs> that's mm. the difference. America's, athletes. Someone told me that once working Everyone's out an long athlete. ago. Everyone's an athlete. Everyone's an athlete. It's a jockocracy. <laughs> Only Dick Sporting Goods <laughs> customers. It's great. It's we got great. we got to keep this moving or Amanda's going to walk out of the studio. <laughs> That's just going to happen. Amanda Lyon is looking at us going, okay. Had a macro credit research at BlackRock. Her world more interesting than ours, and she joins us right now. I love, love, love your research note how you take the CPA, the finance of what you do into the credit, and frankly, the credit sales of your hair 
heritage as well. I'm fascinated what it signals to you when we see mega companies doing mega bond deals where they call four people, including BlackRock, and say, how much do you want? Translate a, f a $40 billion transaction to us. What does that signal? Yeah, I, I think it signals, and thanks for having me. Uh, great to be with you guys. I think it signals that the credit markets are, are open and corporate treasurers are adjusting to this new higher cost of capital environment. In other words, they're not waiting for rates to come down. They're not waiting for spreads to come in further, but they're actually moving forward with their plans. Um, one of the really interesting things to us is that some of the investment grade issuers um, haven't been immune from a lot of the pressures facing the corporate profit landscape and we're seeing that manifest in actually the same performance and similar performance in the high end of the high yield market and the low end of the IG market and so there's a bit of a mixing in terms of performance even across these rating spectrums but to your point Tom the capital markets are open companies are moving forward they're issuing debt and they're moving forward with the strategic planning you talk about quality exposures yes. what's a quality exposure that you're in search of so so what we've been emphasizing is that quality means more than ratings as I, as I alluded to, and really there are a couple key points there. There's pricing power, there's ability to manage through a, an elevated services inflation backdrop. For cor corporate credit investors, capital management priorities are exceptionally important. So it's not just about the bottom line profit, but what is the appetite for leverage? How aggressive is the share buyback program? All of these things matter for corporate investors. And so when we think about quality, it's really that um, competitive set that will allow a company to manage what we view as a challenging growth, inflation, and policy backdrop. Your team put out a, a note that I thought was really interesting overnight about private credit yes. being better than public credit at this point, potentially getting 12% yields uh, in this <clears throat> area and taking over from banks that are pulling back. Why is this an opportunity rather than a risk if many companies could get lower borrowing costs elsewhere if they are better capital structures and better business models? Right. Yeah. So that's a, a note that we co-authored with our colleagues in the BlackRock Investment Institute. Um, and we see two specific tailwinds for private credit as we move forward. And, and really, the catalyst there was the contraction in bank lending that we're seeing um, come through in the Fed Senior Loan Officer Opinion Survey and then anecdotally. And, and really, the, the first tailwind is an expansion of the addressable market of private credit. So borrowers who might have gone to the bank channel or they might have gone to even the equity IPO market a few years ago are now looking to private credit for funding solutions. They may not want to be a, a public company. They may value kind of the strategic partnership of those private credit firms in lending to them. And they're moving in that direction, whereas maybe they wouldn't have done that two years ago. And then the second really specific tailwind is an enhancement of the pricing power that private credit companies can provide to these companies um, relative to the public markets, and that's really reflective of the certainty of execution. Um, so to Tom's point, the capital markets are open now, but we've seen periods of time where they have been shut on the public side. Private credit can extend lending and, and really give that certainty of execution, and we think that that's worth something. This is coming at a time where the senior loan officer opinion survey showed a lack of demand mm -hmm. for a lot of these loans yeah. from smaller businesses. Is that different than what you're experiencing anecdotally? It's very sector specific. I think there are some companies who are still moving forward. They know that they have growth strategic objectives to achieve and they need funding to do that. Um, for the companies that have the luxury of being patient, they may be taking a step back and kind of waiting to obtain that funding. Um, I think the, the lower demand is just indicative of the market kind of um, you know waiting to see what the growth backdrop is. Do they want to move forward with aggressive CapEx? Do they want to move forward with aggressive growth? Uh, but there's certainly a cohort of borrowers that we think will take advantage of the private credit market for funding, just as they have been, um, as Tom suggested, in the public markets. Based uh, on the fact that you actually are in this market, mm -hmm. seeing anecdotally, do you think <sighs> that the end of the banking crisis, that basically people who are writing this off, that that's perhaps too soon? Or do you think that it was overstated and never really happened to begin with? So I think we're watching a few different things. I think the thing that we can feel comfortable about is a contraction in bank lending. We're seeing that in the earnings calls of these regional banks. We're seeing it in the data. Um, and we think that that trend will persist for a period of time, not just a contraction in bank lending, but a higher cost of capital. So that we can feel comfortable with. Um, I think as it relates 
relates to the banking sector, there were kind of two areas that we were watching. One was the asset liability mismatch in March, um, which was kind of the acute focus of the market participants. I think over the long term, we're watching interest sensitive sectors and how that will impact kind of the credit quality of the broader market. So interest sec and sensitive sectors like commercial real estate, for example, that's an area on our focus. I don't think that that's going to be a near term issue that um, we can really um, expect to see flow through into credit quality immediately. But it's something that we're definitely watching over the next few quarters and, and maybe the next few years. Frankly. It's on everybody's yeah. radar right now in a massive way. Amanda, thanks for this. Amanda Lynham there of BlackRock. Brilliant. As always, some brilliant conversations coming from the Qatar Economic Forum. There'll be plenty of our colleagues catching up with the good and the great. Eric Schatz has just caught up with the former Treasury Secretary, Mr Mnuchin. That's just wrapped up. Looking ahead, we'll catch up with Bill Winters of Standard Chartered. That conversation is going to take place in around about 30 minutes' time. I think Francine Lack was catching up with him. So looking forward to that conversation between Francine and between Bill. In the next segment, we'll catch up with Savita Subramanu of Bank of America on equities in the studio. Really looking forward to this because yesterday, as you know, TK, overnight, upgrading deal. the outlook, looking <clears> for 4,300 on the S&P 500. I remember coming into the new year and Savita was pretty clear that the big risk was upside risk yeah. in the equity market and that's basically yeah. what's developed through the year so far. We should talk to her out for an hour and I, I'll try to squeeze it in, folks. Some people have emailed in, but she's just truly expert on ESG. I don't know if we're going to have the time for that, but we may get to it. We'll try and squeeze that in, TK. Okay. You an athlete, TK? Oh, yeah, I am. Crushing it. We're all athletes. All athletes. Equity features yeah. on the S&P, negative 0.2%. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Ukraine cannot win the war against Russia. That today from Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban who spoke with Bloomberg Editor-in-Chief John Micklethwaite at the Qatar Economic Forum in Doha. Orban said, with NATO not ready to send troops, quote, there is no chance for poor Ukrainians to win this war. Hungary is blocking a further $540 million installment of European Union financial aid to Ukraine. It also opposes new sanctions against Russia. Russia is pressuring other countries, including India, behind the scenes. The Kremlin is threatening to upend defense and energy deals unless they block, unless they help block expected moves aimed at punishing Russia over its invasion of Ukraine. Documents seen by Bloomberg show Ukraine wants a financial action task force to add Moscow to its so-called blacklist or gray list. That would put Vladimir Putin's government in the same company as North Korea, Iran and Myanmar. Banco Santander's chairman says she expects more bumps for the financial industry as central banks normalize borrowing costs after a long period of low interest rates. But speaking to Bloomberg Television from the Institute of International Finance Summit in Brussels, Anna Botin sounded optimistic. We've had very low or negative rates for a long time. That creates a lot of misallocation of capital. You're going to continue to have bumps along the road. But this is not a systemic crisis. This is not 2008. Global regulated banks have risen the capital levels from two trillion to six trillion. So we're in a very strong position. Banks are resilient. Dean says she expects central banks to keep rates at the current levels or raise them further because inflation is still higher than the cost of borrowing money. Global News powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. It's okay to be in cash for now, but if you're thinking long term, you need to be prepared for that time where you need to shift assets. But that isn't coming until we get uh, inflation sustainably lower, which again, the path to get there is through an economic slowdown. A fantastic guest this hour. That was Julian Emanuel of Evercore catching up with us a little bit earlier, about 40 minutes ago. Here's the range of views right now on Wall Street. Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley with this to say and why he's still bearish. There are many technical signals that conflict with the idea that this is the beginning of a new cyclical bull market extreme narrowness, poor breadth, quality defensive leadership, broad cyclical underperformance. Savita Subramaniam taking the other side of this argument over at Bank of America, upgrading her price target 
Beer van der team now looking for 4,300 from 4,000. Here's the quote. We prefer the equal weighted S&P 500 to the cap weighted. Double the returns potential given risk to mega cap. Now, Tom, risk cuts both ways. <coughs> and I remember coming into the new year and Savita Ryan to get a note with the team that perhaps upside risk was the most underappreciated risk coming into 2023. And you have to remember coming yeah. into 23, overwhelmingly the consensus was first half dip, second half rip. Yeah. First half ripped on the NASDAQ, that's for sure. All this is is experience, and I was weaned off of 73, 74 into a 75 and then a 76, John. It put it on even more so. Nobody saw it coming. It was completely against the lift. And, you know, just, just the experience here of that singular risk separated from all your best careful analysis. And in this case, it was, you mentioned the NASDAQ up 20 some uh, percent. Joining us now with the shift, Savita Subramanian, head of equity and quantitative strategy at B of A. Give me the quant angle on how we lift up well above 4,000. What's the quantitative place we're in right now that gets us out to a bull market? Yeah, well, so we looked at, um, at a <clears throat> variety of signals. And first of all, narrow breath is not a precursor for doom and gloom. So I just want to get that out there. That Lizanne Saunders government. agrees with that as Schwab. Yeah, Lizanne I think it's it's well. kind of a false negative. And then when you look at valuations right now, they look high, which is another reason nobody wants to buy stocks. But valuations generally look high when you're in an earnings recession, which we are in right now. And I think that when you look at the equity risk premium for stocks, it could actually go lower. And our call is the riskiest asset class in the world right now is the risk-free rate. Basically, treasuries are the bubble. That's the epicenter of the bubble. Everyone's been buying treasuries and pushing interest rates down to close to zero, and now we're working through that. But if we are in this sticky inflationary environment, do you really want to be in cash or bonds? Don't you want to be in stocks that participate in inflation? So that's our call. And I think that stocks are, are kind of you know, reviled right now because everybody's worried that we're going into a recession. Think about it. We've been positioning for this recession for like six quarters, right? So we're now at a point where the average money manager or individual investor is mostly in defensives, more overweight defensives and cyclicals than we've seen since 2008. So I feel like this is another setup for a cyclical rally. You know, 4,300 isn't that far away from where we are today. So we're not being, you know, heroes in terms of the, sure. the cap weighted benchmark. But I do think that you can make money by owning some of these unloved cyclicals that aren't necessarily going to get roiled by, you know, what looks to be, a, you know, not such a bad recession. I mean, our economists are basically forecasting 0.8% peak to trough declines in GDP. Not bad. Not bad. So let's get to it. Let's not bury the lead. 4,300 is not the headline. It's an equal weight S&P 500 call. It's yep. leaning into cyclicals. For the cyclicals, just go through what industry groups, industrials, yeah. banks, what is it about the cyclicals right now that you like? I th what I like about them is that nobody wants to talk about them, that the recession that we're heading into isn't that bad. And we are at a point where um, cyclical sectors have actually become higher quality. And I know this sounds crazy <clears throat> to say, but if you look at energy, metals, even financials, right, the, the big global uh, regulated banks, these companies have been forced to get disciplined because they've been starved of capital for a very long time. We've been in a decade where nobody wants to invest in commodities or metals or mining or banks. And these companies had to basically get disciplined, figure out how to become self-sufficient. And today, I would argue that they're higher quality than a lot of these so-called secular growth plays that have just had a free ride from cheap capital, globalization, like all of these sort of low-quality sources of growth. Let's talk about the other side of that call, yep. especially given that equal weight is going to deliver double the gains of market cap uh, weighted, which I think is fascinating and raises real questions about your tech call. <clears throat> and is it just simply trading sideways, allowing the cycl cyclicals to sort of gain and lifting the index? Index, or does that mean that they sell off? I mean, are they basically going to go opposite each other? So I think there's a way that that big tech can can do all right during this period, and that's if these companies start to shorten their duration risk. 
And and what I mean by this is a lot of these big tech companies offer great growth way out in the future, so they're going to get hurt harder by changes in the cost of capital. What some of these companies are doing is acknowledging that they're too big to grow as quickly, so they're returning cash and shortening their duration. I think that's the way that we can start investing in big tech again, is if we start getting more money up front, and maybe that doesn't happen for a while, and I know it's heresy to say that some of these companies are going to initiate a dividend. All the growth investors that I talk to are like, what are you talking about? That's unthinkable. But you know, look at a lot of these tech companies in the past that have initiated dividends, they've rallied on the news. So I think that this is one of those those themes where as we move forward, the market might trade sideways, tech companies figure out how to navigate higher inflation, a higher cost of capital. Some of them go away. Some of them already have gone away. Smaller banks mm -hmm. I worry about, but big banks I think are still in a, a very good capital position. So, you, so those are some of the things. You've got such a wide net at Bank of America. Are people cautious? Are they gloomy? I mean, I'm getting back and forth here oh on the world. Like, the world's coming to an end. We're all going to die. <laughs> versus, well, that's what they're saying, but they're actually long Apple. What, what's the, well, they're what's long the collective Apple. mood? Yeah, I mean, they're probably long big tech because it's dangerous not to be in those stocks, and those stocks are seen as defensive. I don't agree. I think those stocks are actually more cyclical. But I will tell you, the mood is very gloomy, and I think that bears are just waiting for that downturn. But the one thing that makes me think we're not going to get a downturn is that the question we get most frequently is, I have capital. I'd like to put it to work. Should I wait until the debt ceiling is behind us or do something now? And if everybody's asking that question, we're probably not going to see some major downdraft. That's our call. You think that some kind of debt agreement does deliver a pretty strong relief rally based on that? Well, yeah, I think that, and I think that the reason the market hasn't sold off as much is that there is this sense, even when you listen to the most bearish investors, we all kind of think that they're going to get a deal done, right? I mean, that's the base case. So why bother selling if the base case is resolution? The psychology of this moment I find <clears throat> fascinating. <laughs> if you've made the call already and you're in the market, great. If you're on the sidelines and you're in cash, you're so nervous right now, Savita, because you believe that you're the guy that's going to get sucked in last. <laughs> right, right, right. And it's I mean, start I felt really. Up, and then you're going to yes. smash into the downturn. Of course, yeah. Well, here's the thing: if you look at asset allocations, there are more overweight bonds than stocks than we've seen since 08. So I think that there's less selling pressure. If you look at our own client flows, individual investors have been selling for the past four weeks. We actually saw a big spike in in outflows. <clears throat> that would indicate almost capitulation like levels of selling. So I think that, you know, folks have basically um, braced themselves for this calendar date, this X date. Yeah. And it's it's not necessarily that uh potential. People are loving Savita talking here. I got stock recommendations coming. Do you want to stick around? Yeah, you want to oh, I, the show? I mean, they're loving yeah. it here. Yeah. I mean, Waylon emails. Good morning, Waylon. Thank you for Do emailing. <laughs> Waylon emails in and says, Go long Fender. F N D R. It's long Fender. Emailed in, tell mom, the Bryant, Tyler Bryant, Bryant Pinky Strat, $5,700. Waylon, good call. Yeah, yeah. we'll ask yeah. Santa wow. that one. That's how much that costs. That's how much that costs. Custom shop. And Santa's going to be like, strat. no. <laughs> oh. Savita, thank you. This Thanks was great. Thank you. This was great. Yeah, Savita Subramanian there, Bank of America, with a call on the equal weight S&P 500, which is up 1% year today. I can tell you the market cap weighted S&P 500 is up 9%. And that speaks to the big tech story, the muscle of big tech. This equal weight analysis is really important right now. Barry Riddle's featured it the other day, and I think across every index, including the equal weight down index. Oh, the equal weight it's down. It's very good. It's very important. I've yeah. been looking at that as yes, well. To get yes, there. Fantastic weightings. Very well thought out. If I was at mm. Berkeley with Savita, I would have had the quality F in the class. Would you? Yes. <laughs> I'd be Equal alongside you. Dow. I'd be alongside you. I, I Stan Sovel of, a of CFRA out. coming up shortly. <clears throat> Bill Winters of Standard Chartered coming up after that. Great lineup. Savita, this was great. It's good great to see you. See How long has it been? It's Too many years. Pre-COVID. Oh, that's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. That's ridiculous. It's on the pinky strat. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's going to work. <laughs>
we're seeing this drift higher because people have checked out and there is not much going on in the tape. In the stock market, you really haven't been getting paid to wait. This is going to be a volatile market. We don't expect a big bear market either in US stocks. We still feel confident that the Fed is going to be pausing and so they're not going to have to deliver another hike in June. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen. It's a Tuesday. It's next week, Tuesday. We're looking at Washington, the debt effect, and all that. But really what we're looking at is a bond market speaking volumes. Equities this morning. Sam Stovall to join us in a moment on radio and television. And, John, you and I, we're, well, we're not looking at Sam Stovall's world. We're looking at a two-year yield 4.40%. Yeah, it's amazing. Eight straight days of this now. We <coughs> add some more weight to the front end of the yield curve. Yields up higher by six basis points. So let's call it 4 40 on a two year. And Tom, it's been relentless. At the same time, the equity market has handled it pretty well. The Nasdaq up yeah. again yesterday. The Nasdaq run continues. Somebody earlier, two hours ago or so, said, what are you looking at? They said they're looking at the 10-year real yield. I saw Shanali Basak on the real yield uh, last Friday, and I'm sorry, out to 1.49%. This is beginning to be an elevated and adjusted real yield. I think a lot of people expected maybe a pause next month from the Federal Reserve. They don't want to call it a pause at the Federal Reserve. They want to call it maybe a break, a skip. I don't know what, Tom. But ultimately, it will come down to information over the next month for the June right. call. We've got a debt ceiling debate we need to clear. That's one hurdle. June 2nd, payrolls. June 13th, CPI. They're the three things right now on the schedule, on the calendar, we're all paying attention to. And Lisa, it's about endless Fed speakers. And, you know, I'm making jokes about it. But the fact is there is a nuance between pause and skip, except the stock market doesn't want to pause or skip. It's got a bid on it every day. At the same time, they don't have the data yet, and so they're basically you know, yeah. shooting into the wind. In the meantime, people are sick of being depressed, and I think that that's what you're feeling from a lot of people coming on our show, basically saying, you turn to the person next to you, they're bearish. You turn to the person next to you on the other side, they're bearish. So at what point can you start saying, if everyone's looking for the when, as Savita was just saying, to jump in, you have to think, well, then what's going to happen if they get some well, sort of catalyst? First data point, PCE dis deflator here, uh, May 26, coming up here in a couple uh, days, year over year. 4.3%, I guess that's sticky. You know, 4.3% is not three. It's not where Ed Hyman wants to go. Alarian asked the question, didn't he? If we don't hike in June, what's the next move going to be? What's the next yeah. move? Is it a cut or is it another hike? And if it's a cut, well, why will it be a cut? Because growth rolls over? collapses, we get a recession, or is it because okay. the inflation information is so much better it's improved? And Lisa, that phrase we all love, the immaculate disinflation, yeah, that's bullish. But if it's because of growth <clears throat> and growth is terrible, that's not so bullish. Which is the reason why so many people have been uh, sort of skeptical, but also spinning their wheels, because it's hard to sort of come up with the right narrative. I will say, Citi released some data on card spending. And it actually contrasted with some of the more encouraging signs elsewhere, saying that actually restaurant spending has gone down significantly month over month so far in the month of May. There are signs people are spending less, even in the services area. So at what point do we hit that area I, we, we, where we, we, some of the stimulus we, has been sort of used we got a busy half hour here. we got to get to Bill Winters and, and Qatar, and, and Sam Stovall is going to join us and Mike McKee. But we got to stop here. Can I just state it's no fun going to any restaurant anymore, What's whatever that? the level? It's, it's just outrageous. The prices, the, price the sum prices, if you have, you know, two munchkins with you, and you add it up and you look at the check and you go, really? I mean, do, am I wrong? You're not wrong. You're yeah. Not wrong. I, I just think the whole restaurant thing, as Citigroup talks about, is, is an important thing. I thought thing. you meant yeah. the crowds, Tom. They were too busy. <clears throat> no, they're busy. No, actually. They're busy. I, where I like a 5.30 reservation. I'm a 5.30 kind of guy now. Yeah. No longer about yeah. 8 p.m. 5.30. Yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. 8 p.m.? That's Get like in morning. there early. 8 p.m. is, you know, like, come on. <laughs> Might as well I'm, be, I'm you know. I'm bed by them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Data check. I'm going to go quickly here. we got to get to Sam Stovall. 107.76 on Euro. That speaks volumes. Thanks for that, Tom. Futures, negative by 0.3% on the SP. And I'm with you, TK, in the FX market. This year, I'm breaking yeah. down. Weaker Euro again. Stronger dollar. Eating away at some of those dollar shorts. And eating away at some of those rate cut calls as well at the front end of the curve. Yields up again. 440 on a two-year. Just sub that level right now. Futures. Tom, just a bit softer. DXY, not to 104 yet. We're watching that. This is a joy. I've done a lot of equity today. Savita Subramanian just with us. Uh, uh, John talking about Mike Wilson at Morgan Stanley. We need some common sense. Samuel Stovall joins us right now. Chief Investment Strategist, CFRA. Sam, with cash, do you have the confidence to deploy it now in buying shares? 
Good morning, Tom. Um, I think that what we're experiencing right now is a little bit of sideways action. So it really depends on your time horizon. If you are looking more for short term, you know, I think we're in a challenging period right now, uh, an anticipatory period as to what's going to happen <clears throat> with the debt ceiling, what's going to happen with the Federal Reserve on June 13, 14, and then what happens with the potential for a recession. But longer term, uh, I'm in right. definite agreement that we should be deploying our cash and that the greatest opportunities lie in the mid and small cap arenas. Really important question going back to all of the heritage of CFRA. What is the marginal characteristic right now of your five star rated stocks? What's the nuance there that makes them distinctive? Well, it's basically growth at a reasonable price, uh, GARP. Uh, looking for the where the uh, ex expectations are for earnings, where expectations for GDP growth, et cetera. Uh, and so our belief is that we, when we look into 2024, we're looking at essentially all sectors posting positive returns with many of the growth and cyclical group posting double digit increases, ditto for the market itself. So with a lot of doom and gloom focused on what's happening in 2023, I think we have to look beyond that, uh, look beyond the valley into the coming calendar year. Just looking beyond the valley of the debt ceiling discussion, which everyone loves having, I am wondering if you agree with Savita Subramanian, this idea, we could see a relief rally if it is taken off the table in stocks, even though a lot of people have been saying that stock investors haven't been paying attention, they're not pricing this at all. Are you taking the other side of that? And do you agree with Savita? Yes, I do. Um, I think investors certainly have worked themselves up into a frenzy, reminding themselves what happened in 2011 when we had the last uh, debt crisis that uh, has caused a downgrade in the U.S. credit rating. Uh, we saw all sizes, styles, sectors, and 97% of sub-industries in negative territory. But I think as we were looking last week through Thursday, uh, with the increasing optimism of some sort of a, a debt agreement, we essentially saw a reverse situation where the underperformers were your safe haven, defensive staples, healthcare utilities, and the outperformers were communication services, consumer discretionary, tech, and financial. So I think that we probably will end up with a short-term pop, at least, uh, that then might get muted the closer we get to the upcoming FOMC meeting. Sam, I got to say, you have to wonder at a certain point whether it's just basically the psychology of a market where people have been wrong about a recession that's been perhaps delayed or perhaps taken off the table. They're sick of being gloomy. They're sick of not earning more. They're sick of seeing gains and missing out. At what point is this just basically, uh, you know, a change narrative driven by price gains that now people are going to pile in on and could only persist for a little bit before it's a head fake and they get kind of blown up? Well, it, just uh, that question itself uh, implied a gain followed by a loss, followed by a gain, et cetera. Uh, first off, I think Tom would remember that my father used to say that Americans by nature are optimistic. So you really, uh, it's not really good to be overly bearish because if you are right. right, you're hated. If you're if you're bearish and you're wrong, you're ridiculed. So really, the thought is, where are we likely to be going, and what is the time horizon? So I would tend to say that uh, when we look to valuations, uh, they're not uh, yeah, screaming. But Active. Go ahead, Tom. We got one minute left here because we're going to run to uh, Cutter here in a moment. Sam Stovall, let's stop the show. What you just said is absolutely critical. Could your father have been as productive as he was then in the media milieu now? Can you frame American optimism in the back and forth, and the, 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 the ballet, the opera of the world we live in now? Well, I think that there's a lot more noise uh, today than there was uh, when he, he was in his prime. Uh, and so you know, there's a lot more confusion as a result. Yeah, a lot of uh, the media is focused on sensationalism. Um, the world's going to end tonight at midnight. Tune nice, in tomorrow. <laughs> Come on. I've moved That's away from I, that. I mean, you, well, I mean, it's just the world ends in different ways. It doesn't affect the market. Yeah, but here's, a, here's a headline. So <laughs> stay with us. Tonight. John, give, give right. Kashkari, tonight. Kashkari, we need to get more data about the economy. Sam Stovall's invested. He doesn't care about data from the economy. But sure, this is what Kashkari's focused on right now. Kashkari just does not want to call this 
the end of the hiking cycle. Sam Kashari goes on to say a mild recession would bring inflation down. I think that's a given, isn't it, Sam? Oh, absolutely. We're looking for year-on-year -year core PCE at um, the low 3% this year and then at the uh, Fed's target by the end of 2024. Uh, right now, we're looking at Fed funds above the inflation rate. So that would imply that uh, the Fed is in pause or would have only one more rate hike. And I think the cut starts in 2024. Average time frame between the last hike, first cut is nine months on average. Unless we get some stag in that flation. Get some stagflation, Lisa. Yeah, well, I mean, I actually think that that is the risk that people aren't really thinking about as much. Sure. Because they sort of wrote that off saying, actually, we're back to macular no. disinflation. We're back to the banking crisis. It's going to help everything along. It just something's not adding up to me on that front. Mike, I thought Sam was brilliant there. And what it comes down to, John, you great. and I were talking about this the other day. There's there's a cadence to studying the markets. One of them is you open Barron's on Saturday morning yeah, and yeah. you Thank read you. it. And with Sam Stovall's father, who we all worshipped at the altar, I mean, he, he was foundational in how we learned about optimism and equities. You know, you got to Lou Rukeyser in Wall Street Week Friday night, and there weren't many other distractions. You, you got earnings off the back of Section 2 of the Wall Street Journal. You sat there with a pencil and a cigar in your hand, and you circled the companies, and it was three lines. Revenue, I think net income, and shares. That was it. Sam Stovall, a CFRA. <clears throat> didn't get a chance to thank Sam. Sam, thank you. We're at this point in this equity market rally, Tom. S&P up 9%. Nasdaq Composite up 21, Nasdaq 100 up by close to 26, 27% year to date. You came into the year and you were told you can pick up yield. Go to a money market fund, pick up 4 or 5%, do what you need to do. Then you get to this point in the equity market rally where people are just like, I, I want some of that. And that's what I start to hear now from some people on the south side, that they're starting to sort of buckle just a little bit. So Vita Supermani, I'm talking about the upside, potentially in the equity market, but not, not in the market cap weighted tech muscle S&P 500, but of the equal weight S&P 500 and the cyclicals, Lisa, at the same time, we're having a debate as to whether we're heading into a recession or not. Yeah, I'm just waiting. You know, two months, people are going to be like, actually, go go headlong into tech because that's what's going to be there. I'm just going to be looking at this one story out of Reuters saying that this AI startup that was backed by Alphabet just raised $450 million in funding, even despite all of this freeze that goes yeah. on everywhere else. They mentioned AI. People are like, here, here's a million. Here's two. Well, here's ten. It changes. First of all, it's just a melt up. It's just technical. It's just positioning. And then people start to attach stories to it and they start to say it's AI, it's cost cutting, it's more than that. And then people start to say, I want to buy. That seems to be the way these things go. And I just wonder if we see some more of that. Looking forward to more of this. Fantastic conversation coming up right now with our colleague and good friend Francine Lanqua sitting down with the CEO of Standard Chartered at the Qatar Economic Forum. Hello, Fran. Hi, John. Thank you so much. I am delighted to speak to Bill Winters. We'll talk about oh uh, the Middle East. We'll speak <laughs> about uh, markets and we'll speak about everything in between. Bill Winters, thank you so much. Great to be here. For joining us. We'll talk about the banks and we'll talk about potential takeovers or not of Standard Chart in a second. But what do you worry most about the markets? Is it the debt ceiling? Is it a banking crisis? Is it Fed policy mistakes? I mean, right this minute, I'm not worrying about too much because I think things feel actually in a reasonable stasis in the world. Uh, of course, we're worried about the debt ceiling, but I heard the reassuring comments both from, uh, from President Biden and Speaker McCarthy yesterday. I, I have to think these guys know uh, what they're playing with, so I I'm okay on that. Uh, I think this, the structural uh, resistance of inflation to come back down, that's the biggest concern. Not right at this moment, but just as that plays out over time, what's economic growth look like? I I've been very impressed by the resilience in the U.S., in Europe, and of course this region, the Middle East, is booming. Asia is booming, yeah. India is booming, despite higher interest right. rates. So I, I think feel okay. Bill, if you look at the debt ceiling, even if we have a resolution, are we playing with fire? Does it actually put the U.S. as a reserve currency, as like you know, leader of the free world, at risk? Look, I mean, we've been the, the, the politicians in Washington have been playing with the debt ceiling for decades, yeah. and you know, so far there's not been an accident. Of course, every time it happens, we wonder, you know, given how crazy yeah. the politics is in the U.S. right now, is this going to be the time that? But the fact is, the Treasury, the Treasury markets are behaving well, credit markets are behaving well, so the market is not pricing in a bad outcome here. There's a lot of money in the Middle East. Do you think they're after a bank like yours? Uh, look, I think everybody in the world would love to own a piece of Standard Chartered Bank, because 
It's a strong bank. We're doing well. We've got this super interesting footprint across Asia, Middle East, and Africa. So you're a takeover target. And we're target. cheap. So you're and we're a takeover cheap. target. Like I say, if somebody wants to, to, to come and say, we can add more value to this bank than what you're doing today, where you're growing it at, at uh, double-digit growth rates, profits at uh, substantially higher, you can have an idea on how to do something better, please let us know. We'll come in. Uh, but is there, you know, the, the fact is we're a global bank today. We're adequately scaled for the environment. We're growing quite nicely. That's all I'm focused on. Okay, if you look at regulators um, in, you know, in the UK and elsewhere, would they be ready for takeover of a large systemic bank by you know, Middle Eastern money? Well, I noticed that there was a takeover of a large systemic bank in Switzerland a few weeks back, and it happened in a weekend. So I guess that means that's in, the, domestic. In, the right, well, <laughs> in the right circumstance, uh, you know, regulators can get things going. Uh, I think the, uh, it, it's very impressive to see uh, how the, 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 the various investors in the Gulf, uh, just we're sitting here in Qatar today, I just uh, had a panel discussion with, with the head of the, the, the Qatar Investment Authority, that's a very impressive investor, right? with, with, a, with a truly global perspective, a lot of experience investing. And I, I think these, the, the various countries in the Gulf, of course, are accumulating savings right now, and they're diversifying their economy. So that's why we're here. That's why we're investing so much capital into the Middle East, because we see these huge opportunities to connect that, that capital with all the opportunities in Asia and vice versa. So do you need to, to have a bank to do that? Yeah. No, you need to have a bank like us that's prepared to, to, to play that bridging role. What's the hardest thing being a bank right now? Is it how you deal with China? Uh, look, right at the moment, I think everybody's very focused on, on liquidity. So even though we're, we are, we as a bank, and I think the banking industry broadly, is extremely liquid and will remain liquid even after we go through a period of quantitative tightening or whatever. Uh, but the rules changed when Silicon Valley Bank went bust and then Credit Suisse went uh, in, through its turmoil yeah. a week later. Uh, so everybody's looking hard at whether the deposits are as sticky as we thought. Uh, I think that, 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 that as so many things have yeah. made it through these testing periods, we'll, we'll, the industry will be fine here. I'm sure Senator Trevor will be fine. Uh, so that's the immediate concern. I think in the, in, in the longer term, for, for, uh, from a banking perspective, of course, we've always got an eye on the east-west tensions, but you know the best thing that happens to our business is we keep trade levels very high, which is what they are. I mean, we're record record levels of trade between China and the U.S. Just as an example, uh, but China is accelerating its pace of opening up, opening up its capital markets, and for a bank that's structurally a connector, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. And how can you be sure that it's opening up for real without a step forward, two step backwards? Because we're, we're sometimes hearing mixed messages from, from the Chinese authorities. I, I think when you look over, really over the decades now, uh, China has been sort of race ahead, consolidated a bit, race ahead. I think that's quite normal. The, uh, structurally, China is part of the global economy in a very, very big way and wants to remain part of the global economy in a big way. Uh, in order to do that, they, they need to liberalize the arrangements for capital and goods and services moving in and out of China. That's been a steady objective for, for decades now. Uh, it's accelerating at the moment, uh, I think for all the reasons around the geopolitical tensions, and I think it will continue to move forward. But will they take time from, from time to time to consolidate? maybe just pull back a little bit before moving forward? Of course. Bill, when you talk about deposits and actually liquidity, do we need to look at depositors' base at some of the banks? Is there too much concentration? So it, are we going to see more regulation? And is that regulation warranted, or could, could yeah. it be like wrong regulation? It's a, it, it, it's a big question. Uh, I think it's, it's very clear that there were some deposit bases, in particular in the U.S., although some would say Credit Suisse as well, yeah. that were too concentrated. And, uh, and we know that the market was merciless with those players. We know that in, in the U.S., the, the, the Fed now has put a, a term funding uh, facility in place. It's not a guarantee of the banking system, but it is a very, very substantial backstop. So I don't think we're going to see any more crisis. But I think everybody's looking to say, okay, let's think again about how sticky those deposits are. But, you know, Francine, at the heart of it is banking is a confidence business. And if we're going to have a fractional reserve banking system, technical term meaning right. you borrow, a, you take deposits right. and, you, and you turn them. Right. If we're going to have that system, central banks are going to have to, to accommodate that with, with transparent liquidity facilities for healthy banks. But d does mobile banking change anything? Because we used to have no. to queue up and actually get deposits Yeah, we used to have to queue up. But, but I'll tell you, the moment that there was a queue in front of Northern Rock in 2007, the bank was done. So in fact, in some ways that might even be worse because it was visible, it was a news story. Uh, so no, mobile banking means everything goes a bit faster, but yeah, bank runs are bank runs, and as soon as you lose confidence, it's hard to get it back. Does the end of Credit Suisse actually mean that you get market share in Asia? 
Look, I mean, Credit Suisse's business is being distributed across the market. UBS acquired a lot of it, but UBS was already the 400-pound gorilla, so they can't they can't retain everything that, that came in from Credit Suisse. Uh, some of the money had moved before. Obviously, there was almost well, over $200 billion of outflows. Before that, that money all went someplace, and it's not all going back to UBS. So yeah, we're, we're, we're picking up uh, we're picking up RMs, uh, yeah. we're, so relationship managers. We're picking up assets under management. We're picking up some loan market share. Yeah. And that's, How much? Uh, do, do you have we, a we had, of like We had $20 billion of inflows last year, uh, and another five or so billion into our private bank in the first quarter of this year, which in the overall scheme of Credit Suisse is not a big deal. Yeah. For Senator Chartered, it's, it's, uh, it's material. But we talk about the UK almost every day as, you know, it could do better, it needs to be better, there's not enough investment. Do you worry about the UK and, and London specifically as, as a capital market? I'm a big believer in the UK, right? It's a fundamentally resilient place. I, I, I think uh, Rishi Sunak and, and government are doing the right things right now. Of course, politically, they, they've, got, they've got a challenge mm -hmm. given, given everything that we've been through. But uh, I think the country is doing the right thing. It's incredibly resilient. I think the fact that, that uh, we've not had an actual drop in economic, you know, negative economic growth, no recession, yeah. quite impressive given the buffeting in the economy. Uh, but there's an inflation problem. There's a. I think there's uh, there's there's some all sorts of challenges around corporate governance, which which have to be worked through. Okay. Well, we'll have to get you back on to talk about that, Bill. Thanks so much, Bill Winters. There, standard charger with that, John. I'm going to send it back to you. New York, and we'll have plenty more throughout the day. Hey, Francine, wonderful work as always. Francine Lacqua there with Bill Winters of Standard Chartered sitting in the Middle East at the Qatar Economic Forum, answering questions at the beginning of that conversation about the potential for a takeover. <coughs> plenty of speculation about potentially first Abu Dhabi yeah. Bank come again. Interesting, he wasn't exactly screaming, We're not for sale. Was yes. he there, TK? Yeah. He sounded open. Yeah. I thought Francine was at open. a new level of rude there. She really brought it up early in the interview. and. You know, he was receptive to talking about it. He wasn't the usual response. Standard Charter is a wonderful bank. First of all, he can you imagine being an executive like Bill Winters and Steve Englander comes in and you get a briefing from the best cross rates guy in the world? The state's that's, one of the best. That's very cool. Their heritage is emerging markets and everything around the China Rim. They are you know, I, I'm sure Mr. Winters would correct me, but they're sort of the frontier bank. I don't mean that in a narrow sense of troubled economies, but they have a heritage there that you would think somebody could pick up for distribution. Attempting to get a read on, on what's happening with China. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. Plenty of great conversations coming from the Qatar Economic Forum. They will continue, no doubt, throughout today. And over the next 24 hours as well. For the broader equity market, equity futures right now negative by about 0.2 percent. Plenty more Fed speak through the week, and we've got Mike McKee with us around the table in the studio. Mike, what have we learned so far from the Fed officials this week? Now, the Fed is kind of divided about what they think is necessary to do on June 14th because uh, half of them think that we don't have a tight enough policy to bring down inflation. Inflation's kind of stalled out. Now, Friday, we get the PCE numbers. We'll see if that influences people. But we've had an unusual number of Fed officials say they would be willing to vote for a rate increase on uh, June 14th. And it's unusual because Jay Powell's kind of come out and said we, he doesn't think we need one. Do we have a sense of what data they're watching for? We had the senior loan officer opinion survey. Didn't really move the dial, but everyone pretends that it still was the preeminent uh, survey. What's the next one that we're looking for? Uh, Friday, we'll look at personal spending and income and see if uh, Americans are still hanging in there. The retail sales report suggested they are. And then we get the PCE <coughs> deflator, which is the number that the Fed looks at in terms of inflation. And we'll see if it has moved at all. Forecasts are it's just going to stay about where it is. We've gotten the easy stuff out of the way, and now the hard work of bringing down inflation begins. Then you've got jobs next week. And uh, the 13th, the day before the Fed meeting, is CPI. Yeah. We won't know their reaction to that until we get the uh, Fed decision. But uh, that's going to be very interesting. Mike, I'm riveted to the minutes tomorrow. You know I am. And it's some, several, and a new S word, skip. <laughs> what is skip? Well, some people are trying to parse the uh, idea of not uh, tightening in June by suggesting they could go in July. And that would be a skip as opposed to a pause where they don't go again. Uh, the question is, do you think you are tight enough? And right now, a lot of I was with don't McKee so. the first time the phrase V shape came up, and he literally spit out his coffee. I do understand why they're being so delicate about the moment. <coughs> and I'm sure it's equally as frustrating for them to talk about it as it is for us to listen to. 
when they say pause, the market hears cuts. And yeah. I guess, Mike, that's something they're trying to manage right now. Well, it's definitely something they uh, try to manage. They see uh, financial conditions loosen because the markets are calling for cuts. And that's one of the problems that they have with the idea of are they tight enough going forward to bring down inflation because we are seeing some loosening out there and that uh, is makes it less likely that we'll get a quick reaction in the inflation markets. It's exactly what Lisa said earlier this morning. Mike, good to catch up. We'll catch up again in the next hour. Mike McKee's going to drop by and talk about the Federal Reserve. Also dropping by, Jared Woodard of Bank for America. You Sarah Hunt the of Alpine Saxon well. Woods. That's what we do. It's just, it's Amy Will Silverman of RBC. And we'll catch up with Scott Kirby of United Airlines on how he's going to make our travel so great this weekend. Going That's into someone. Memorial Day weekend. I know who's <laughs> going to be on your set with you. He's going to come Can by and just ask why him can't do some things Ryan about, you know. He's got some things. No, I'm going to bring up Michael O'Leary. We're going to have the chat. Yeah, run some video of... Of Michael Leary laughing at we, Scott Kirby. We're going to talk uh, about drama. that. And pilot contracts and, yeah. and Denver Airport, which I was quite impressed with when Denver, I went through really? last year. Yeah. How long did you spend Wasn't there? too bad. 30 minutes. It was enough. <laughs> <laughs>
And once we get through that process, that was all very smooth and gradual. But the challenge is that we have now, over the last few months, added a banking crisis and tighter credit conditions and a banking situation where banks are seeing much less demand for commercial real estate loans, much less demand for CNI loans. Those indicators are now at 2008 levels. Those things raise the risk exactly, as you're saying, Tom, that we may have that nonlinear slowdown over the coming quarters where tighter credit conditions may be accelerating the slowdown in the economy. This is the key debate. Is this recession delayed or a recession interrupted? And we're looking at data. And is there anything to give us any indication ahead of it? Or do we just have to wait and see what mystery box awaits us? No, absolutely, because the challenge is if we threw $10 trillion at the economy, sucking that out again is going to take time. And how do I weigh that in my quantitative model purpose of the U.S. economy, where on the one hand, we had huge stimulus that's still stimulating. And at the same time, the Fed is trying to slow things down and we have tighter credit conditions. So the market thought, and that's what the chart is showing today, that the recession would have come like six months ago. But now it's taking a longer time to take that $10 trillion out. But what we do know is that the Fed is very, very keen on getting inflation down from 5% to 2%. And as long as that's the case, the Fed will continue to step on the brakes. The Fed will continue to slow down earnings growth and the Fed will continue to slow down hiring. There's been this sort of conundrum baked into the market where suddenly people are rethinking whether there was actually a banking crisis, perhaps taking that away from the equation a bit. And you're seeing yields creep higher and it hasn't really taken a bite out of tech valuations. Do you think that there really has been an economic sea change resulting on artificial intelligence, resulting from some of the shifts in uh, allocations of people's pocketbooks? I do think that very importantly, first of all, inflation is still way too high relative to the Fed's target. So importantly, the Fed will look at inflation at five and say, we have to do more to get inflation, at least keep rates at these levels for a longer time to get inflation down. And there are two reasons for that. Namely, first of all, housing is beginning to recover. That's putting upward pressure and housing, as usual, makes up 40 percent of the CPI basket. So that's lifting potentially inflation down the road. And the other thing is also that wage inflation is also <coughs> coming down too slowly. In other words, wage average hourly earnings at four and a half percent is not close to the two, three percent we were before the pandemic. So that raises the risk to your question, Lisa, that inflation will be sticky. And if inflation is sticky, that does mean that tech and growth and venture capital and particular growth I mean, the Fed is trying to slow down growth. Yeah. That should mean that growth should not be performing well. You're right tech. on cue. David Rosenberg publishes moments ago out of Toronto on sticky inflation. And he goes all Newtonian on us and he looks at first and second derivative. What's the derivative right now of the disinflation that we're seeing? And at what level do you have to get at where you've got legit second derivative convexity down to a lower level? Yeah, there are two problems. Inflation, and we'll <clears> get the new numbers on PCE, but that will just be the derivative of the CPI we just got. But the problem is inflation is at five, and five is not two. And most importantly, and it's five not- five is not four. It's not four either. And therefore, five is not even moving down to two. If you look at the six months change, the three months change, the 12 months change in core CPI, it's still moving sideways. So yes, it is true to say that maybe owners' cool and rent and housing inflation could be coming down eventually. But with a lot of indicators in housing, traffic of prospective buyers <clears throat> is going up, existing home sales is going up, new homes is going up, right. home buyer confidence and home builder okay. confidence is going up. Even the number of bids per home has also right. been going up. So that's all telling you that if CPI, in particular the housing component, starts to go up, inflation will indeed turn out to be more sticky. Lisa and I hang on every word you publish. Farrell could care less. But but we hang on it. And one answer is mortgage rates back up. 6.x percent. Suddenly, six days, seven days, eight days, we're at 7.04 percent, 30-year bank rate. This time, with mortgage rates going up, what's it mean? Yeah, so at this point, it's not only mortgage <clears throat> rates that have been driving the housing market. It's also that jobs have still been strong and wage growth has still been strong. So on the scale here, that has clearly been dominating what has been happening to mortgage rates. And that's why housing has started to show a recovery. The fact that there are more bits per home sold now than there were six months ago is just stunning when you think about where mortgage rates are. So that means that we will get to that inflection point and to an earlier discussion where we might get that sharper slowdown where it no longer well, like this. what, Friday or Monday? No, no, so this may be several <laughs> months down the road because, again, remember both the banking sector tightening conditions and also mortgage rates at these levels. Eventually, the Fed will succeed with getting inflation down and we should not doubt their commitment to getting inflation back to 2%. Which takes us back to where we started, in a sense. This $10 trillion of stimulus that was pumped into the economy and the uncertainty of where we are in terms of breaking
breaking it down and pulling it out of the economy. Do we have a sense of how much was sucked out and how much just keeps getting circulated in terms of wages and bigger incomes that go into spending? Absolutely. That's really the key question because the only way we can really get a good handle of that is to try to look at the data for how much savings is left across the income distribution. The Fed has quarterly data for that. Some of the banks, uh, Citibank and Bank of America, have data that also on the private level. And the conclusion is still today you have both for high, middle and low income groups still a higher levels of savings at these cash and checking accounts than what you had in the fourth quarter of 2019. So the answer to your question is we still need some more time before that excess savings has been worked down to a lower level. And that's when we ultimately will begin. We've seen, you spoke about this earlier, we've seen some of the credit card data showing some signs of weakness. You also seen on my Bloomberg screen, restaurant performance index also beginning to roll over a bit. So there are some early signs of maybe consumers are beginning to hold back and delinquency rates also, in particular for lower FICO scores, are also beginning to go up. So yes, there's some early signs of cracks for the US consumer, but it's still exactly the question you're asking. Pretty difficult to get an exam firm handle on what is the timing, but it is coming. No one should doubt that a recession is on the horizon. There's a big debate about what caused the inflation. Was it this question of some structural changes with people exiting the work fa uh, workplace and just uh, perhaps re-globalization or deglobalization, and how much was just money mon uh, modern monetary theory failed? That essentially, yes, if you do just print money, you're going to get more inflation, and that's essentially what happened. I mean, how much can you parse out these two things? Yeah, so if you throw 10 trillion at the economy, no wonder that you get some inflation. And if you at the same time lower the capacity of the economy, meaning lower the supply side, if capacity starts shrinking, you both have more demand and you have less <clears> supply, <throat> that's a recipe yeah. for inflation going up. So now we're trying to balance that by processing demand, that by hiking rates, mm -hmm. and supply chains are coming back. So that means supply is coming up to get the economy more in balance so that you're, we have talked about this for many years, the Taylor rule, if I look at my Bloomberg screen, says the Fed funds rate today should be nine. That's obviously not where we are, but well, if we are so far away from the Fed's goal of inflation and unemployment that we still need more to do to get to the point where there's more balance between supply and demand. Let's go to Chicago School by way of Austria. M2 has been a study. Most people say ignore M2 doesn't have recent academic validity. I'm sorry, M2 took off like a moonshot and it's cratered. What's it mean? So I would look at M2 as a reflection of the 10 trillion that was thrown in terms of aggregate demand that came along. And M2 is indeed now collapsing, but that's because the Fed is trying to withdraw liquidity. Yeah, the yeah. Fed is trying to really slow the economy down. And we should, in equity and credit markets, not underestimate the commitment that the Fed has to slow down earnings growth, slow down hiring. The whole idea from the Fed is to slow down consumption, slow down capex spending. That's a very, very strong commitment to saying we need to slow the economy down in order to get inflation down from 5 to 2 percent. To put a bow on it and to follow up on what you said with the Taylor rule and a possible 9 percent <coughs> Fed funds rate, which a lot of people say is implausible at this moment, how mispriced do you think where Fed funds rates should go in order to slow this economy, to bring out some of this $10 trillion of stimulus? Well, I think, as Tom was saying, that's exactly the debate on the FOMC at the moment. Some FOMC members are saying, we no longer need to hike more. And others are saying, but wait a minute, maybe we do need to hike more because maybe the transmission mechanism is saying that more is needed. So I do think for sure, at least, we will need to have rates elevated for a lot longer well, than what markets are pricing the at the moment. The economist James Diamond, I believe, I, I, I believe he said he's a little leery on quantitative tightening right now. I mean, is that the heart of the matter? The Fed's going to have to blink and lose QT? So, well, there's a lot of discussion about what is the sequencing of how do you actually tighten policy. And here, at this point, if you think that it is needed to get long rates further up to, say, cool the housing market well, down. Well, you've been driving them up. Torsten Slack alone has us to a 442 <laughs> year at yield and a 30 year bond for a 4%. Yeah. I mean, this is what we've seen this grind higher as people really rethink this. Because idea the recession has been that, delayed. And right. if this delayed more, well, okay, no. if it's not coming, maybe rates do need to go up a bit more. I'll get the chart on Twitter. It's clearly the chart of the day. He is Torsten Slack of Apollo Global Management. Just brilliant with us uh, this morning. Futures at negative nine to VIX. A little bit elevated, 17.63. Stay with us on radio and television. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Qatar Airways is beefing up its presence across much of the world as it continues to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. CEO Akbar Albakar spoke exclusively with Bloomberg's Manis Cranny on the sidelines of the Qatar Economic Forum in Doha. Now that uh, we are ramping up, we are introducing new routes in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, and of course going back uh, big time into China. Al Walker says ticket prices will continue to be higher, and he said the airline will wait and see before ordering new planes. 
Saudi Arabia's top energy official is issuing another warning to oil short sellers just over a week before the OPEC alliance is due to meet. Energy Minister Prince Abdullah Aziz bin Salman spoke at the Qatar Economic Forum. Speculators uh, like anything in any market, they are there to stay. Uh, I keep advising them that they will be ouching. They did ouch in April. The prince is famous for telling short sellers they would be left, quote, ouching like hell. The government of the state of Qatar is the underwriter of the Qatar Economic Forum, powered by Bloomberg. And United Airlines is announcing its plans to significantly expand as Denver's leading airline. The company will add 35 flights, six new routes, and a dozen new gates and three clubs, including the largest ones in United's network. The airline will add new non-stops to six destinations, including four not served by any other Denver airline. We'll speak with United CEO Scott Kirby in the next hour. Global News powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. tightening that I'm seeing in the data and that I'm hearing from my contacts in the banking sector could be as worth as much as a couple of rate hikes. My own personal starting point, though, is one or two rate hikes. Right now, you know, absent a, a big change, I think we're, we're comfortable, I'll be comfortable saying, let's just look and see how things play out for a little bit. There's, uh, as Raphael said, a whole month's worth of data coming between now and then. So I still see a whole month of information, so I don't prejudge June. Tom Barkin of the Fed, along with Mary Daly, Raphael Bostic as well. A lot of Fed speak. Lisa, help me here. We got more Fed speak today. Like, yeah, Lori Logan, we can't she's get speaking to at 9. The quiet period. We can't get to that soon enough. Well, I'm curious to hear what data they're looking at and kind of how they're <clears throat> framing this out. But they yeah. don't know either, and that's the tricky they part. They don't know either, it's and the, the only thing the is, you, seriously, folks, you get the majesty of what they wrought. In 1912, I think it was, and then particularly what McChesney Martin did at 51, each of these people is different. And I think with the speaking, we see that. Well, and just, you know, just to highlight <clears throat> how uncertain this moment is and why different views are important to rethink this paradigm that we're in is Torsten Slock really defining what happens when you pump $10 trillion of stimulus into an economy right. that's never seen that scale before. And all of a sudden you have to understand an economic model that doesn't really have parallel. And that, I think, is what they're struggling with as well in their communication. We're going to get oil right now. We're going to do that. The future's a negative 10 here. A bit of a deterioration with higher yields, two-year yield 4.39%. We printed 4.40 moments ago, higher yields this morning. But we want to look at oil. And oil is real simple. American oil, 7305 up a stick is uh, elevated. Brent is not back to $80 a barrel, 76.97. And I thought it would be really good to get Will Kennedy, head of all of our commodity and hydrocarbon analysis, to join us as Bloomberg celebrates the Qatar Financial uh, Conference that we're having, some very good interviews on the Persian uh, uh, Gulf. Well, Kennedy set the scene for the United Arab Emirates wrapped around the Persian Gulf. Yes, Iran as well. But set the scene of how the Middle East right now looks at oil. Well, I think that a lot of the countries in the Middle East would like oil prices to be higher from here. I mean, 77 on the face of it looks quite healthy, but... My colleague on Opinion, Javier Blas, wrote an excellent column yesterday explaining that 77 just isn't what it used to be. And a lot of these states, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Qatar, have big spending commitments and they need those oil revenues to meet those. So I think we heard from the Saudi oil minister at the Qatar Economic Forum today, um, and he was clear that uh, people shouldn't get too short on oil, that he's willing to surprise the market again. Clearly, they had that surprise cut back in April, and that was aimed squarely that people trying to short oil, but it had, it had a momentary fizz, but it, it's now gone. And there are a lot of hedge funds who are very short this market. The hedge fund positioning is as short as it's been in almost 10 years. So he was trying to send a clear message today with an OPEC meeting just over a week away that right. uh, traders should not be complacent about 
what OPEC may or may not do. I think this is just brilliant. This idea that we have in our head whatever a fair price of of oil, a barrel of oil is, and certainly Javier and you and your team are saying, you know what, folks, it's much higher. Give me a statistic. I mean, where's where's the correct price for Brent crude? to find that general equilibrium theory within oil? Well, I think that if the people running the Saudi finance ministry, the people at the top of the Saudi government, would probably, they don't say what they want the oil price to be. That's a matter of policy. They don't target prices. They claim that they just target uh, supply and demand balance. But I think if you look at Saudi finances, they would be much more comfortable with an oil price closer to $100 a barrel. Wow. Meanwhile, there's a question of whether the low prices relative to that $100 barrel uh, mark, whether it's because of supply or <clears throat> demand. And Javier wrote this column recently just talking about how it's not as much a demand side story and it going down, but rather a supply side story and the fact that Russian oil has actually been accelerated in terms of its production, that it never went away, that Iranian oil is making its way to the market. You look around the world, all of these actors that were thought to be sort of removed from the action are anything but how much is that a big part of the story that this is supply people weren't counting on? I think that's exactly right. And Russia, of course, had pledged to cut by half a million barrels a day uh, alongside the cuts announced by the rest of OPEC um, back in April. And they haven't, um, from what we can see, they claim to have done it, but it's very hard to see that in the market. And actually, Russian oil exports, which is at the end of the day what matters to the supply demand balance internationally are as high as they've been since the start of the war, and they're, they're still rising. So there may be some frustration in the rest of OPEC Plus that uh, Russia isn't uh, pulling its weight. Now, that hasn't yet been expressed publicly, but behind the scenes, you've got to think that they want Russia, they need Russia to follow through, because right, right now, the salient fact about the oil market is Russian oil continues to flow uh, at unconstrained rates into the global oil market, and competing with Middle, Middle <coughs> East oil in Asia you know, they, all that Russian oil is going to India and China now. Um, and that is certainly weighing on sentiment and certainly weighing on prices. What does this do in terms of the partnership of the plus part of OPEC plus? The idea that Russia's voice at the table perhaps is that much more fraught, already fraught, but that much more so if they're working at odds to the goal of the OPEC members that want to see oil close to $100 a barrel. Well, it's, it's important to say, Lisa, I think that rhetorically Russia is still very committed to the alliance. Uh, it claims to be doing what it promised to do, and Putin went out of his way uh, to praise uh, the alliance, and it's important to Russia uh, last week. Uh, from the OPEC side in the Gulf, they want and need uh, Russia to stay in. So I think people are uh, publicly saying that everything is fine, but you must wonder what tensions lie underneath. And it will be interesting to hear uh, from ministers and see what decisions are made when OPEC meets in just over a week. I want to talk. This is completely off the mark, but Will, you're so good at this. I can, you know, I can make it up as I go, Will Kennedy, and you're going to bail me out here. I'm looking at a Japan with an economic experiment, Will Kennedy. You and I have never seen. How critical is Japan to the marginal price of oil? We studied that it was critical. Is it still critical? I don't think it's what it used to be. It's still important. It's still uh, in the top three oil importers in the world. Um, but really, the market is being driven by Chinese demand and increasingly Indian demand. I think China's economy clearly is slower, weaker than people was expecting. Demand might not be what it was. But when we look at India, I think that's now the Asian country to watch as the marginal uh, demand of oil. Uh, it's just going to soak up energy. It's so hot there. Um, people are turning on air conditioners now. That drives yeah. uh, coal and demand as much as anything. But I think it's illustrative of a country that uh, is getting richer uh, quickly with a middle class, and that mm -hmm. needs oil demand. So I think Japan is important, but the country that we really need to watch, Tom, is India. Very good. Will Kennedy, thank you so much. Leading all of our hydrocarbon and commodity coverage uh, is well. really just can't say enough about that. And he circles back to what Javier and others have said, India uh, really uh, matters. Lisa, I, I've got it with the yields moving here, 4.39% uh, in the two-year yield is just stunning. Further curve inversion, the 10-year yield becoming elevated. And I want to go back to Amanda Lynham at BlackRock today, who I think was just brilliant about 
when I say corporations adapt, I'm looking at it from an accounting standpoint over to equities. She took it right over to bonds, which is hugely important. And she said, without hesitation, they're adapting and adapting fast. Well, and that's actually increased their credit worthiness, <clears throat> especially on, on the margins, because they've paid down their debt. They've been more, more responsible. And all of a sudden, you have all of these factors coming together to support credit at a time when a lot of people have been predicting that it would fall out of bed. <laughs> so at what point do you see that story hold in, even if that benchmark rate does go higher? And it's, it's, it's the tension. It's just a muddled moment right now trying to well, understand the different you know, various inputs here that are at cross uh, odds right now. And, and the thing that's important to me is we're just finally getting back to a normal rate environment. I mean, there's a high, huge body of people out there that have never experienced, I think Savita mentioned it, a risk-free rate. We've never experienced getting back to where there's an actual true sharp ratio, there's an actual calculation of what cash is worth. Right, and people don't know whether this is the new <clears throat> normal or whether we're going to go back to what it was before. To me, this idea of when could we get inflation back, that was the question for two decades where people were saying we're never well, going to see inflation again. Basically, <clears throat> just print money, take a helicopter, take a bunch of cash and throw it down, and we tried that. And guess what? It created inflation. You know, ask me tomorrow. I may change my mind. But the singular headline of the last 10 days, folks, and this off our great economic decks, was Scott Landman. John Williams of the New York Fed, we will get to a lower structured r start. To me, that was the most important headline that we've got. Yeah. It filters into everything. And coheres with what the IMF is saying as well. Where else are you going to get this, folks? Surveillance <laughs> on the 9 o'clock hour. John Farrow talking to Ryanair. John Farrow talking to United Airlines. Nowhere else on the planet are you going to see that. <laughs> Kirby of United. Next. <laughs>